go live. And I remember right that. <clears throat> Daniel. Okay, I've uh, I've hit us. I've hit my my stream live. I've started my stream. So ready when you guys are. Just you got making it. sure everything runs fine. Okay, can everyone uh, in my chat, my stream, hear? Sound is good? Hi. Hi, Daniel, mic check. Mic check, Daniel. Sounds good. Sounds good. Why am I hearing myself? Do you happen to have a watch page of the event up anywhere? Like, uh, do you have a YouTube tab that is looking at your watch page? Oh, uh, yes, I have the YouTube tab. <laughs> Open. Okay, that's close. So that's good. Sorry, that's embarrassing. No worries. <laughs> happens all. No, happens time. all the time. Right. Good. Great. I am uh, set over here, so I just we're backstage still, so they can't see us or hear us. But I have started the stream just to be sure that the connection is strong. And then, what I do at the very start, <clears throat> and just to be sure that I absolutely remember correctly, is if I remember. <laughs> Let me just double check that way I don't uh, I keep your guys' faith. So format wise, I have Harris going first for the opening. And Oh, I'm going first. Okay, good. And then I've got so which will be about twenty minutes if you absolutely need that long. And then yeah. roughly fifteen from Daniel, and then the hour back and forth segments with one less segment for Harris since the opening is extra long. And then one hour of open discussion after that, and then 30 minutes of Q&A. Perfect. Wait, who are, uh, for the Q&A, are you going to just pick questions from the audience or uh, James? Yeah, like, in the chat, people usually, when they tag me with at Modern Day Debate, that's where the questions come from. So sure. if they have two tabs open, like if they're watching both at your channel as well as at Modern Day Debate, if they tag me at the Modern Day Debate live stream, then I can... Uh, then I'll see those questions. It's hard for me to monitor three chats, though. <laughs> no, no, that, I, that's totally understandable. Well, I, well, how about how about um, if you if you just open my chat as well uh, later on? Obviously, not now. Um, then you, you'll have Daniel's, mine, and yourself, and then maybe you just look at the. Uh, I don't know. It, you don't have to read everyone. Just pick randomly if you if you, if you pick any question. Um, I could try. The only, challenge, the only challenge is that I have both. I, I have technically I have like a Twitch modern day debate chat that I monitor, and then the YouTube one, and then doing your guys' on top of it would be four. So like it's a little bit, it's a little bit hard for me to monitor all those for questions, but I can try my best. No, no, I, well, it's okay, well, like you'll get the questions in your chats, and then if there's no, literally no questions for me or no li questions for Harris, then you can figure out what to ask us, but I think it'll be fine just to monitor your own stuff. Yeah, you that's got fine. it. I'm, I'll I'm see okay what I can that. do. I'll try to be flexible and let me just double check that the picture and everything's coming through smooth and we'll be off to the races. Okay. So what I will do is I always do a cold open at the start where I'll say, hey, everybody, today we're debating should we have human rights or Sharia law? And we are starting right now. And I'll say, hey, welcome everybody to Modern Day Debate. And we are going to hand it over to Harris for his opening statement. And I'll say, Harris, the floor is all yours. And then both of you, like, feel free to, you know, in introduce yourselves. And we'll give you a little extra time for that, like an extra minute if you need. That's totally cool. And I will, throughout the debate, mention that your links are in the description as we want you guys to have plenty of exposure. And then any last questions? Nah, let's get this underway. Cool. All right. Excited. So I'm going to kick it over in... Thanks for your patience. Here I go in three, two, one, ready, set, go. Hey everybody, this morning we are debating Sharia law versus human rights and we are starting right now. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Modern Day Debate. Thrilled to have you here and we are going to start with Harris's opening statement. Thanks for being with us, Harris. The floor is all yours. Well, thank you very much. 
Um, I just want to start with by saying that every other conversation I've had with my adversaries, I've had it with the intention of trying to find a common ground, try to find the best outcome, try to understand each other's positions. Uh, but pardon me for my skepticism, but I'm certain that this debate is not going to go that way because, to say the very least, my opponent is not interested in objectives I just mentioned. He's more interested in scoring points, beating his chest, and basically performing to his audience. Now, this is something I have never taken part in, so it's going to be a good, good experience for myself as well. I've always had an open mind, and, that, and the fact that I no longer believe in a religion or a worldview that I was indoctrinated with is the evidence of my open-mindedness and of people like me. However, some people stay in the same worldview or a frame of mind they were born into. This is not just terribly sad, but it's but it also shows this closed-mindedness of people like Daniel and Peter too. I'm sorry to say this in advance if this debate if this debate gets rough and out of hand because it's very hard to respect my opponent as he pretends to be a serious-minded objectivist, but his antics show the exact opposite. Now, let me use this opportunity to welcome any serious Islamic apologist, and I will give you full respect, as I've done it in the past, with people like Mufti Uthman Farooq, Uthman Badr, Mufti Abu Layth, and people like massive superstars like Hamza Ali Abbasi, ex-Pakistani movie star, now has become a full-on die. As I said, it's very difficult to respect someone like Hakeem Kijun, not because of his outrageous beliefs, because more or less most of these guys share some of these views anyway, or because of his open incitement to murder and torture and enslavement of people, but because of his antics, even outside of this discourse, such as ma making fun of people's mental health, uh, resorting to little childish antics as though it's a pre-boxing show or something, uh, being more interested in claiming victory rather than having a meaningful discussion. Hakikachu openly says he doesn't need validation from Westerners or non-Muslims to respect the Islamic values or practices. Then the question arises, what is he doing here? If we assume that his statement is true and honest, then he is obviously here to reaffirm the belief of young Muslims who are losing their faith. Why? Because these young Muslims are fast becoming ex-Muslims. People like Hakikachu are the last hope of these confused young Muslims who are struggling to make sense out of the barbaric and outdated teachings of Islam. Sharia being one of the most troublesome, which has clearly no place in the 21st century. As progress hits the Muslim countries, the birth rates go down, and as a result, the growth of Islam is likely to slow down by 2060. Pew survey shows Muslims produce 2.9 children per woman, per woman, at the moment, however, it is likely to reduce as, let me quote Pew, the declining growth rate is due primarily to falling fertility rates in many Muslim majority countries. It said, noting the birth rate is falling as more Muslim women are educated, living standards rise, and rural people move to cities. I will put this uh, opening statement up on my website and the link will be given for your reference. Um, I, on the other hand, have a totally different take. I want to reach out to Muslim youth. I do care what Muslims think of us. My whole activism doesn't rely on helping young secularists and atheists to hold on to the rope of atheistic faith. No, because once you become an atheist, you become a free thinker. You don't need Dawkins or Hitchens or me. You can think for yourself. And this is why I reach out to these young Muslims. I'm trying to educate them about the dangers of Sharia, the barbarity, and at the same time, making them realize the value of human rights because Sharia is a totalitarian ideology, much like Chinese Communist Party or Kim Jong-un's Democratic Republic of North Korea. Acknowledging and respecting human rights will end up respecting you, your life, and that of your loved ones. It is by long shot the best deal you can have. Now, after this debate, Hakikachu and his fanboys are likely to claim victory, as they always do, because if they don't do it, they feel that their faith is irrational, which obviously it is, and that is the reason why they have to claim victory. On the other hand, atheists, people supposedly on my side, will also nitpick some of my arguments and responses. Why? Because atheists are self-critical. That is the beauty of it. So I don't judge the winners or losers by popular opinions of others, because in these cases, everyone vouches for their own guy, except atheists, of course, and I don't want them to change. The winner is determined by how many people are convinced by whose worldview. If tomorrow I start seeing comments that I was an atheist and Hakikaju gave some mind-boggling answers in defense of amputations, sex slavery, stoning, torture, beheading, etc. And in light of these amazing arguments from Hakikaju, I have now decided to leave my debauchery-riddled atheism aside 
and become a Muslim. Now that I've said it, I certainly expect some fake atheists claiming just that, but we all know that's never going to happen. On the other hand, I still get comments from people who watched my debate with Utman Badr nearly three years ago in a Sydney university, or with Hamza Ali Abbasi, or with Utman Farooq quite recently, and people send me messages and say they were Muslims and now they've left Islam. I expect more messages like those for many more years to come. Not necessarily because of me, but because of being exposed to these conversations that they were deprived of. But it was the start of a journey. They looked it up, they listened to other people, they investigated their own faith, and they flipped. Because the only thing that keeps people in their circle of faith is childhood indoctrination and the consequent ignorance, which can, we, we can both say is not the case with Hakikachu, or some sort of an emotional trauma, which is most likely the case with Hakikachu. I wasn't aware of Hakikachu's actual story, which I was made aware of a couple of days ago, and I don't wish to talk about it out of respect for a fellow human being who was wronged by a society she was living in. But I have always believed people who are so dogmatic about their worldview, least to say as obviously false as Islam, there must be some sort of an emotional trauma. I assume it would be the case of experiencing racism in white America, as a lot of children of immigrants suffer from in their schools. As a result, they develop identity crisis, and that's what I assumed would be the case with Hakikachu. But after learning about his story, I had this sudden feeling of sadness and that heart-sinking feeling. But at the same time, it made me wonder how could someone who would have gone through so much, whose family would have gone through so much, yet he becomes sadistic almost, loses all human compassion in the process and wishes the same kind of injury upon others like wishing death for apostates, homosexuals, adulterers. Someone who would have gone through a personal tragedy, who would have seen his family members cry for countless amount of hours, who would have experienced depression, sadness, anxiety, yet he makes fun of other people's anxiety or their depression or their suffering. What could turn a man's heart into a stone? This reminds me of a story when Stalin's first wife, Kato Swanitse, died at her funeral. Stalin said, this creature softened my heart of stone. She died and with her died my last warm feelings for humanity. So sometimes a personal tra tragedy can create monsters and they become source of immense suffering for all those unfortunate enough to be living ar around them. The reason why other Muslim scholars don't openly adhere or preach the very values that Hakikachu so proudly and boastfully propagates is because they might be Muslims. They might revere Prophet Muhammad, but they are not sages or psychopaths who are totally devoid, devoid of compassion and mercy. But that is not the case with Hakikachu. He had to turn off his, his compassion switch in order to accept Sharia in its entirety. No sane person can advocate and propagate Sharia. We have seen videos of ISIS, even seen videos of ISIS soldiers throwing homosexuals off the rooftops, which Hakikachu promotes, crying because they probably hadn't turned off their compassion switch as their leader Baghdadi had. But just imagine for a moment, you find out tomorrow that I've been captured by the Taliban and they've executed me. A lot of Muslims upon hearing this news, not even the sadist ones, the normal ones, might say, hmm, he was a dick anyway, he deserved it. But now imagine they filmed it. I can guarantee some Muslims will be troubled by that and they will start making excuses like maybe he should have been given a chance to repent or maybe we should leave these matters to Allah or they would try to make some other types of excuses. Why? Because they haven't turned off their compassion switch as Hakikachu has. Now imagine they actually film torturing me and then slicing my throat while I'm trembling as the blood slowly gushes out of my throat like a slaughtered cow. I still like to believe majority of Muslims will not be happy. This is not wish wishful thinking on my part. In fact, it is the only reason why ISIS could not get popularity amongst Muslims, amongst the very Muslims who say we want Sharia, like most followers of Hakikachu. But why? Because most humans haven't or can't turn off the compassion switch as Hakikachu has. Once we see suffering, we have this natural reaction of, of disgust and outpouring of compassion. Now, in all the three mentioned scenarios, I could expect a tweet from, actually, he lost his Twitter account for propagating the same brutal and sadistic punishment. But anyway, he could he would find a way, maybe on, on, on Facebook, to express his happiness by saying something like, Murtad has finally met his well-deserved end. Laughing emojis. Ha, ha, ha. Why? Because he has become a sadist and there's no compassion left in him. I want to ask the Muslims who are watching this, 
is this the kind of society you want to live in that is that is not that is brutal not only to the obvious murderers or rapists we can put that aside for a moment but those considered by sharia as criminals who have no victims like homosexuals apostates or adulterers is this who you want to be if the answer is yes then it is a sad case for you if the answer is no or you try to listen to people like Hakikachu to rationalize this barbarity for you by saying things like, oh, for the collective good, we have to punish apostates and homosexuals or whatever, then it means something is bothering you. It means you still have your humanity, compassion, altruism intact. In fact, I was told recently Muhammad Hijab went out of his way to find a no execution way out for apostates. He even made up an explanation for it. Why? Because I realized maybe even he has some compassion left in him. Unfortunately, same can't be said about people like Hakikachu or Ali Dawa, who's proud of executing apostates. This is why Sharia should be condemned. Sharia, in its literal application, demands you to turn off your compassion, altruism, and humanity. This brutal system is not just against you or me or some sort of an ideological standpoint, but it is anti-nature. Nature in, in the form of evolution has put feelings like altruism and compassion in us. And Sharia can be anything but, but compassionate or, or altruistic. I feel sad about the terrible story of the young woman. And my last couple of days were actually spent wondering how much should I talk about this? Should I bring it up without hurting anyone? And I want to say my heart goes out to Hakikachu's family, and I don't blame them for being bitter with this so-called Western justice system. I have often said that, if, that I am against capital punishment, but if something like this had happened to me or my loved one, I would be going for the torturous execution of the perpetrator. But I also understand that this position would be a position of a grieving family member. It would, it would be based on emotions and not rationality. We know Hitler and Stalin were both beaten up by their respective fathers. They were both victims, but their personal tragedy cannot be ignored or not brought under scrutiny if we want to avoid the crimes those psychopaths committed. Personal tragedy is no excuse to turn the lives of other people into tragedies. This is where I see Daniel Hakikachu. He's had a terrible experience, and I fear this experience has turned him into a cold-blooded, heartless, compassion, compassionless sadist at best or psychopath at worst. Ideas like Hakikachu pro propagate are dangerous for everyone sharing the planet with him. How many Mullah Umars or Baghdadis will come out as a direct result of Hakikachu's views? We don't want to know the answer. I think there might be. From Sharia. Oh, now on the other just hand to be, out, pardon my interruption. Wait, just the last like maybe five seconds at prose. I just want to be sure the audience gets to hear your opening. If you want to repeat, maybe. I had 20 minutes. I had 20 minutes. Oh, what I was saying was that your your feed froze, so right. it wasn't at least on this side. We couldn't hear the last okay. like ten seconds or so. If you want to repeat it, okay, okay. Let, let, let's just go with. So I, I'll start that again. This is where I see Daniel Hakikachu. He had a terrible experience. He's had a terrible experience, and I fear this experience has turned him into a cold-blooded, heartless, compassionless sadist, or at best, or psychopath at worst. Ideas. People like Hakikaju propagate are dangerous for everyone sharing the planet with him. How many Mullah Umars, Baghdadis, will come out as a direct result of, the, of Hakikaju's views? We don't want to know the answer, so stay away from Sharia. Now, on the other hand, what am I proposing? The quest for implementing brutal punishments that Sharia hands out comes from either personal grievance, as it is most likely the case with Hakikaju, or from, or from a very simplistic worldview that hardcore punishments somehow reduce crime. If your position is that of Hakikachu, then I think you would all agree that it is an emotional position and not rational. If you are a Shariaist due to the latter belief, then let me break it to you. Corporal or brutal punishments not necessarily lower the crime. Let me give you some examples. Homicide rates in Saudi Arabia, where you get beheading for murder, is 1.3 per 100,000. Whereas in Japan, which is a far bigger country than Saudi Arabia, it's only 0 0.3 per 100,000, where there is no capital punishment. Finland, Sweden, Norway, all of these countries have less homicide rate than Saudi Arabia. I'm not saying that not giving capital punishment is the reason for lowered murder rate, but I'm saying that giving out death sentences does not lower murder, murder rate. The problem is far more complicated. It depends on various variables like economic prosperity, for instance, attitudes 
towards honor culture, alcohol problem, divorce rate, etc. If you defend corporal punishments for this reason, then as I showed you, it's simply not true. So we can deduce that having Sharia is not just useless, because it doesn't serve any purpose, it doesn't lower the crime, at best, but very dangerous at worst, because public executions, totalitarian societies devoid of free speech and personal freedom is not conducive to a healthy lifestyle. On the other hand, legal system built on reason, debates that go through rapid evolution is not only useful, but also beneficial because it brings happiness, prosperity, and overall, a better quality of life. You got it. Thank you very much for that opening statement. And want to let you know, folks, if it's your first time here at Modern Day Debate, we hope you feel welcome no matter what walk of life you are from, whether you be atheist, Muslim, Christian, you name it. We are glad you're here as we are a nonpartisan or neutral channel and we want everybody to feel welcome. So what we are going to do is kick it over to Daniel for his opening statement. Thrilled to have you here, Daniel. The floor is all yours. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, salatu wa salam ala rasulillah. Thank you to Modern Day Debates for hosting and thank you to everyone watching. Uh, the debate today is about Sharia versus human rights. Sharia just means Islamic law. Islamic law is not just corporal punishment, it's a holistic system of life that governs everything from how Muslims pray and worship, how they get married, to criminal punishments and even economic matters. My main point today is simple. Harris Sultan and other ex-Muslims are playing a con game. They're being dishonest with their audience and sometimes outright lying to them. Today I'm going to focus on three of their biggest lies. Lie number one, promoters of human rights like Harris claim human rights are a beacon of hope. Human rights are the mark of civilization and progress and everyone should adopt human rights. But is this true? Do human rights bring prosperity and progress? 192 out of 195 countries of the world have officially adopted the UN's Universal Declaration of Human Rights. That's 98% of all countries in the world. Do we see prosperity and progress in these countries? Let's look at the GDP per capita. North America is at $61,000 per capita. Western Europe is at $54,000 per capita. Australia and New Zealand are at about $55,000. These regions are at the top of the heap. It must be because they are so strong in terms of human rights and democracy, right? But let's compare that to Eastern Europe. Just $9,000 GDP per capita. Latin America is less than $7,400 dollars per capita. India, the world's largest democracy, is only at $2,000. Sub-Saharan Africa is at $1,500. For Muslim countries, the average G GDP per capita is $7,500. And if you exclude the oil-rich countries, the number is at $4,600. So when people want to say Muslim countries are economically behind because of lack of human rights, the reality is Muslim countries are at the same level as most of these human rights respecting countries. Why do countries like America, UK, Britain, Australia have 10 times, 20 times, 30 times the GDP per capita of countries in Latin America, Eastern Europe, Sub-Saharan Africa? Why this massive inequality? None of the countries in these regions are Muslim and all of them respect and abide by human rights. Consider Botswana considered one of the oldest democracies in the Southern Hemisphere, one of the earliest adopters of LGBT rights in Africa, very high female involvement with voting and politics, but it has only one-tenth the GDP per capita of the US. Or consider Haiti. They ratified their secular constitution in 1805, over 200 years ago. They had a female president in 1990. Their GDP per capita is one-fiftieth the United States and on and on. On the other side of the coin, you have countries that have openly rejected human rights and democracy, like China, which has a GDP of $10,000, and Singapore, which has a GDP per capita of $65,000. So either way you look at it, there is no correlation between adoption of human rights and democracy with economic prosperity. Harris, you need to explain this. These countries that have nothing to do with Islam, that have adopted human rights and democracy and women's rights and LGBT rights, why are they stuck in abject poverty? Because you want to blame problems of poverty, problems of violence and social dysfunction on Islam. 
So how do you explain these countries that have nothing to do with Islam, that have these same problems and often worse problems? Why is it that human rights only brings prosperity for North America and Western Europe and the majority of the rest of the world suffers? Better yet, explain why people living in human rights abiding democracies in Latin America, in Africa, are literally dying to migrate to America and Western Europe. Why are they risking their lives to escape their human rights hellholes, Harris? Explain that. And we don't have to just limit ourselves to GDP. Look at the life expectancy. Latin America, Eastern Europe, Sub-Saharan Africans have five to 15 years lower life expectancy. Those countries also reported far lower happiness levels. According to the UN's 2017 World Happiness Report, according to self-reported happiness, countries of North America and Western Europe have the highest levels of happiness, while Latin America, Sub-Saharan Africa, and Eastern Europe have the lowest levels. So why is this, Harris? None of these countries are Muslim countries. They're all democratic countries, secular countries. Some of them even have very high levels of atheism. So why aren't they enjoying progress and prosperity? Let's call this question the Botswana question. If Harris cannot explain these discrepancies, if he cannot answer this Botswana question, then he should admit that democracy and human rights are just a big hoax. Harris wants people to hate Islam by trying to pin the issue of poverty and social dysfunction to Muslim countries, but as we've seen, it's not a strong connection. Lie number two, Harris wants to pretend like his problem is with Islam, but in reality, his criticisms of Islam apply to every single religion and every traditional form of culture, because all traditional religions and cultures clash with modern human rights. Traditional Christianity, traditional Judaism, Native American culture, Hindu culture, Shinto religion, all of these traditional ways of life clash with modern human rights. This is because human rights is an extremist ideology. Human rights ideology says that the most important thing is individual liberty and equality. Individual liberty and equality have to be prioritized over literally every other human value. This is extremism. Every other traditional religion and life philosophy says, no, individual liberty and equality have limits. Islamic law, for example, agrees with the human rights activists that, like Harris, that individual liberty and equality are beautiful values. For example, in Islam, you have the right to your wealth, to your property, the right to privacy, and so forth. Also, Islam provides legal equality between all people, men and women, Muslims and non-Muslims, in certain, but not all, areas of the law. But Islam says, yes, individual liberty and equality are beautiful values, but they're just two out of many beautiful values. And sometimes you have to restrict liberty and equality in order to preserve other important values and institutions. A useful analogy here is imagine offering a child candy or broccoli. If it were up to the child, he would choose the candy every time. Eventually, the child would get diabetes and die. That's what human rights liberalism is like. It's just about giving the candy of individual liberty and saying that's all that matters. Islam says, look, there's nothing wrong with candy. In fact, we love candy. But if you only eat candy, you will die. You also need meat, dairy, vegetables, and carbs. As a simple example, in Islam, you can't have sex with whomever you want, whenever you want. There are strict restrictions on premarital and extramarital relations. And the obvious benefit of this is that it ensures strong and stable marriages. This is because of human biology and natural human psychology. Islamic law perfectly accounts for human nature and abiding by the Sharia has these clear benefits for marriage. But human rights says, no. People should have 100% individual liberty and 100% sexual autonomy. You should have the right to sleep with whomever you want, whenever you want, unimpeded. That may sound good to those who have been indoctrinated by this extremist ideology, but we have to ask, what are the consequences of such a policy? Is a society that adopts unfettered sexual autonomy compatible with marriage, with love, with romance? Is it compatible with family? Well, we don't have to speculate. We can look at countries where this so-called human right has spread, and the statistics paint a very bleak, dark picture. And I'll discuss the exact statistics later in the debate, inshallah. Another example is family relations, because just <clears throat> family relations beyond just husband and wife. Science and anthropology say that 
humans have this deeply rooted biological drive to come together in families. And these families have a natural hierarchy with fathers as the heads of the household, then mothers, then children, and so forth. Again, this human behavior is biologically rooted, and historians and anthropologists point out that the same patriarchal family structure is found in 99% of human societies historically, including Islamic societies. But human rights extremism says, no, this kind of patriarchy with men over women violates the principle of equality. Men and women should all have the same authority, the same roles, and everything has to be exactly equal. This is not only an attack on Islamic law, this is an attack on human biology itself. This is an attack on 99% of world cultures which do have patriarchal family structures. And the result of this human rights extremism that has been forced onto the whole world for the past 200 years is that families are being destroyed. Again, I will share, inshallah, more information to justify all these points. But the main point is that marriage, family, community, and even the human race itself, these are things that have a deep-rooted biological basis. Islamic law preserves and protects these things by setting the proper balance with individual liberties and equality and other important values. Modern human rights, in contrast, destroys marriage, destroys family, destroys community and all traditional cultures and the human race overall because it puts individual liberty and equality above all else. The question is, does Harris believe in balance or is he the extremist? Let's call this the balance question. Ultimately, Harris would be lying if he said that his problem is solely with Islam. He should be honest. The problems he has with Islam violating human rights, he has with all traditional cultures and religions that limit individual liberty for the sake of protecting marriage, family, and community. Harris should be honest. Instead of saying human rights versus Sharia, he should say human rights versus literally every traditional culture and religion in the world. Lie number three. What is the difference between Harris Sultan and European colonizers? What is the difference between Harris Sultan and the neocons in Washington who pushed for the murderous invasion of Iraq and Afghanistan 20 years ago and continue to agitate for human rights in the Muslim world today? What is the difference? Let's call this the colonial question. Because all the arguments Harris brings against Muslims in Afghanistan or Pakistan or anywhere else, all of those exact same arguments have been used by European colonizers historically against not only Muslims, but against Native Americans, against Africans, against Aboriginals, against the Chinese. When Harris says Muslims abuse women because they practice polygamy, that exact same argument was used by American settlers in the 18th and 19th century to dehumanize Native Americans and justify genociding them. When Harris says Muslims are barbaric because they use corporal punishments against criminals, that exact same argument was used by the European colonial empire against the African tribes they genocided. The real question is, does Harris think the colonial project was a good thing? After all, colonialism was, is what brought modern human rights to all these different parts of the world. The West invading and occupying the world to bring freedom and democracy isn't something that just happened in Iraq and Afghanistan. It's something that's been happening for over 200 years. If Harris thinks human rights are so amazing, then does he think it was a good thing that Africa was colonized or Latin America? Does he think it was a good thing that India was colonized? Wasn't it colonialism that brought his own Muslim ancestors in the subcontinent to the light of reason and human rights? So Harris, my question is simple. Clearly the world is not going to freely choose human rights. History has definitively proven that, and Afghanistan is only the most recent example. If you really want people to abandon their religions, abandon their ways of life, their cultural heritage, and replace them with human rights, you have to force them. And forcing people inevitably gets very brutal and very bloody. That's the only way. That's why the 19th, 20th, and 21st centuries are soaked with the blood of non-Europeans who were killed in the name of spreading freedom and democracy. So are you going to be honest, Harris, and stand by colonialism? Look, if human rights are so wonderful as you claim, Harris, then 200 years of brutal colonialism and millions of dead must have been worth it. Why don't you own it, Harris? When you advocate human rights, you're like a chef that presents this appetizing sausage to your audience, but you aren't honest about how that sausage is made. Muslims, at least, are honest. Islam is honest that spreading Islam sometimes requires war, 
That's acknowledged in the Quran and the example of, of the Prophet, peace be upon him. And I'm not equating Muslim conquest with European colonialism, by the way, because there are ma major differences that we can talk about. For one, Euro-American colonialism, past and present, is genocidal, and the death counts make that very clear. But my point is, you human rights activists are not honest. You don't own up to the true horrifying nature of spreading freedom and democracy. So Harris, if human rights are so brilliant and fantastic, then be consistent. Tell us that the millions of deaths and the brutal occupations are worth it. You can't make an omelet without breaking a few eggs, right? So just own it. Stop pretending you're something you're not. You're just playing a con game. The only way you can credibly sell human rights to your audience is if you hide all these things or gloss over them. You hide the brutal history of human rights. You hide the fact that human rights destroys marriage, family, community, how it attacks every traditional way of life. You have to hide all these things because otherwise no one would buy it. And actually it would make Islam look pretty good because Islam is fighting against these, this human rights monster. But you can't be honest, can you, Paris? So just stop with this con game. Okay. okay. We will jump into the next section, folks. Want to let you know, as mentioned, welcome to Modern Day Debate. If it's your first time here, we're a neutral platform. Our guests are linked in the description. So if you're listening, you're like, I want to hear more of Harris or I want to hear more of Daniel. You can hear more by clicking on their links in the description. And that includes on the podcast as we link our guests there as well. Now for today's format, it's a little bit different. So we're going to have an hour of, well, technically a little bit less than an hour of five minute segments from each speaker. So we'll be starting with Harris for five minutes and then we'll go to Daniel for five minutes and we'll keep rotating back and forth. I reckon... I, re I reckon you should start with Daniel with the first monologue because I've already lost mine. So that would put me like two behind. Oh, I was going to take yours off the end, but we could do that as well if you'd like. Yeah, uh, I think that would be better that way because that... we, we can stay stay on top of what Daniel is saying so I can respond to it. If Daniel is okay with that, I'm, I'm open to it. And then also want to let you know, folks, if you happen to have a question, feel free to tag me in the live chat with at Modern Day Debate. Makes it easier for me to see those questions as well as the Q&A at the end. But Daniel, if you're okay with it, you can start the five minute sections. It's up to you. Uh, let Harris go first because I can just extend a little bit my last two and just blend them together. Okay, the two all right. Two. Okay, see how nice I am, Daniel. What was that? Uh, I said, see how, how nice I am. I've actually said yes to everything that you said so far. Yeah, I'm a sadist, apparently. So you're very nice. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah I know. Oh, we'll I'm not, I'm not seeing any minutes. emotions from you. Go ahead, Harris. It, it is good. All right. Let's get to the, the next one then. Okay, so the proponents of Sharia base their argument on the claim that it is objective morality because it comes from the creator of the universe. Therefore, whatever he says is true and by their definition, this is objective morality. We cannot understand why it is like that, but since he's saying it, therefore it is objective and inherently good. But when we scratch the surface and put it under the microscope of reason and logic, it is anything but objective in nature. So let's examine this claim. Objectivity means something that is absolutely true in its claim, regardless of conditions, feelings, or opinions. Basically the opposite of subjectivity, which relies on interpretations, limited understanding, opinions, and is conditional. So I've thought about it for a very long time, and I'd like to see Daniel's view on that as well. If we are to take morality, in this case called Sharia, from an outside agent, in this case Allah, on the claim that it is objectively good, then there are four options. Option one, Allah is only capable of giving out good commands, consequently, he is incapable of giving out evil commands. If you assume this premise is correct, then indeed morality does become objective, I'll give you that, but it violates other claim traits of Allah himself. For example, he is incapable of giving out evil commands, meaning he is not omnipotent. He's just a calculator, like a calculator can, can't tell you two plus two equals five, so we can trust him. He doesn't have free will because even if he wanted to give an evil command, then he can't do it as he pleases. He can't lead people astray. He, can, he can't give them wrong directions, causing them to burn in hellfire, which is against Allah's traits as per the Quran, chapter 14, verse 27, which also entails that Allah leads people astray as he wills, meaning he can give them wrong directions, which is kind of an evil command, knowing that, he, that the person is headed towards an eternal abyss, which also violates in turn Quran, chapter 7, verse 28, which says he can't give evil commands. So it is safe to say that this is not the case with Allah, and this premise doesn't fulfill all the characteristics of Allah. Now, option two, which is more likely 
a lot of Muslims take that one. Allah is capable of giving out evil commands, but he chooses not to, as it is against his nature to give evil commands. In this case, his condition of omnipotency is restored. If we assume this premise is correct, then we could expect good directions from Allah, because it is not in his nature to give wrong directions. But that would require faith, which is inherently the opposite of objectivity, because objectivity requires us to be able to test, verify, and measure. As per the premise, all the commands might actually be all good, because he chooses never to give an evil command, but it can't be called objective. You could argue that in your limited wisdom, Harris, you might not be able to see the bigger picture, and that and what seems like a wrong direction to you might actually be a good direction, such as the case Allah ordering Abraham to sacrifice his son. Abraham accepted it as Allah's good command because of his faith. He had no way of knowing that Allah had a different plan, unless he had faith in him, which he did. So in principle, he required faith not evidence and hence for us to determine a command is objectively true we need to be able to test it for example if you told a blind man that the moon emits white light it might actually be objectively objectively true but the blind man it would before the blind man it would require only faith to believe in it the blind man is confined by his limited vision as us humans are confined by a limited wisdom but for us to believe it's objectively true we'll need to be able to measure it ourselves although this is the most agreed upon option but it also violates Quran 1427 and Quran 27 as Allah has purposefully made people blind and put a seal on their heart so they can't even see his wisdom just have faith in him but even but then in other place Quran says chapter 15 verse, 70, verse 75 look at the signs I have left for you it is literally asking a blind man to see how can I see if you have blinded me option three God gave God can give any command and by virtue of it coming from him it just becomes good which basically means that God can turn good into evil and evil into good. This is a logical fallacy because for good to become evil and vice versa, these two entities have to exist independently. This is like making a four-sided triangle. You can't do that. It's either a triangle or a square. Just like that, objectively, it's either good or evil. Creating evil only to turn it into good defeats the purpose of creating evil in the first place. For example, Allah allowed Adam's children to have sex with each other and produce babies only to turn it into an evil action later on. If we look at it in absolute terms, then it can't both be good or bad at the same time. It's either evil or good. This proposi proposition creates further problems once we admit that God can turn evil into good and good into evil, then as I said earlier, it breaks all bases of rationality. Every other rational criticism of any other faith or proposition becomes irrational because anything can happen. I wonder why Muslims make fun of Christians with the concept of God is the Father and the Son. Um, if we assume God can violate basic fundamentals of reality, then he can be the father and the son at the same time. And Christian faith becomes perfectly irrational and rational at the same time. But Muslims don't buy that. This proposition also violates the Quran, as Allah himself says in the Quran, chapter 7, verse 28. Allah gives no evil command. So this verse might put him back in the option one, but we already know that that option doesn't fulfill all the other characteristics. Now, option four Ten seconds is left. Allah... Allah just gives evil commands and not good commands. I think we can all agree that that's not the case. So if you look at it, on, honestly, Allah doesn't fit in any of these options. Why? Because it's so contradictory that you can't fit in fit this box in any circle. Hi. In detail. We'll kick it over to Daniel for his opening state or his five minute rebuttal. Go ahead, Daniel. Okay, uh, my claim again is that liberal secular human rights regime has been a disaster for the human rights. Uh, race. Note that in Harris's response, he didn't address any of my questions, so we're going to see if he's going to answer anything in this debate. I'm going to focus on four main examples. Liberal human rights destroys marriage, family, community, and the human race overall. So let's start with marriage. I want to address may many, maybe most of you in the audience directly. Do you know why you are alone? Do you know why you can't get married? Do you know why if you are married, you are very likely to get divorced? Do you know why there's a very high likelihood that you will die alone? All of this is because the liberal human rights regime is destroying marriage. The fact of the matter is marriage is deeply rooted in natural human instincts. We crave romantic affection. We want to give and receive love with a long-term committed partner who we have children with. Psychologists and neurobiologists call this pair bonding. 
Pair bonding is this instinct to bond with the opposite sex in a long-term relationship. Most animal species don't have this pair bonding instinct, but 3% of animals do have pair bonding, like most birds, certain primates, and also human beings. Being in long-term committed married relationships is associated with countless benefits and in terms of health and happiness. The Washington Post reported that studies prove that married people have happier, healthier relationships than unmarried couples who simply live together. But human rights has destroyed marriage, and it's easy to understand why. If you're constantly prioritizing individual liberty, individual happiness, then that conflicts with the long-term sacrifice and commitment that marriage requires. Stable marriages require you to give up your individual autonomy in many significant ways. And liberalized people are not interested in that. And the stats prove it. Nowadays, most people are not getting married. According to Pew, 65% of millennials between the ages of 23 and 38 were unmarried in 2019. Pew predicts that in a few short years, 75% of millennials will never be married. This will be an all-time low, according to Pew. Now, you might think maybe people are not getting married, but they're still having long-term unmarried relationships. Not true. According to the Washington Post and the General Social Survey, the share of U.S. adults reporting no sex in the past year reached an all-time high in 2018, underscoring a three-decade trend. About one in four adults did not have sex the whole year, and the numbers continue to increase every year in what experts call sex, re uh, sex recession. In some countries like Denmark and Spain, governments have to literally beg their population to have sex. Now, if you're in the minority who does get married, then the likelihood that your marriage will end in divorce is very high if you live in liberal democracies. In the U.S., about 44% of marriages end in divorce. In France, 51%. In the U.K., 42%. These stats don't even factor in long-term separation between couples. If we counted that, the rates would be even higher. The likelihood your spouse will cheat on you is also very high in free liberal countries. Some studies have found that the infidelity rate is as high as 26% in some Western countries. Those people who do get married are also going to have lower quality marriages. Studies show that having multiple sex partners prior to marriage reduces marital quality. People are less satisfied with their spouse when they have been around the block a few times, literally. By the time people do get married in the West, in their 30s or 40s, they have had so many failed past relationships that they're often emotionally damaged. The person you're marrying comes with all this baggage in addition to your own baggage. So the overall marital quality suffers. But Muslims, because of Islam and Sharia, are on the opposite end of all this. Yes, modernity is affecting Muslims, unfortunately, but we're on the opposite end in terms of these stats. Numerous ethnographic studies of Muslim countries prove this. Muslims get married more, they get married younger, they have far lower levels of premarital and extramarital sex, they have lower divorce rates, and due to all of this, they have higher quality marriages, love, and romance. This is because of the rules in Islamic law that specify gender separation, hijab, and modesty, restrictions on fornication and adultery, patriarchy and gender roles, family involvement in marriage and so forth. These are rules the liberal human rights regime considers backwards and misogynistic, but these are the same exact rules that save Muslim marriages from the destruction that Western society is suffering from. So Harris can give this abstract discussion of objective good versus evil, but marriage and love is something that humans all value. And I'm citing stats, I'm citing studies that everyone can agree with and everyone feels viscerally because that's human nature thank you very much we'll kick it over to harris for his five minute rebuttal as well okay if someone claimed that he's all wise and knows about the past and the future and always has the right answer you would expect him to give you an absolutely complete and true statement every time he utters a sentence this is a claim of quran of the quran as well that's a perfect expectation and allah claims to be just that is he all-knowing, as it is said in the Quran, chapter 31, verse 34, or in the Bukhari, 318? He already knows what's going to happen later today, tomorrow, and a million years into the future. If he does, then why does he change his, why does he change his statements all the time, or at least completes them, implying his first statement was either incomplete or unclear, which is against his claim of it being a clear book, as Quran Chapter, chapter 5, verse 15. For example, Allah, which is Muhammad, says in Quran, chapter 4, verse 95, not equal are those believers remaining at home 
and the mujahideen who strive and fight in the cause of Allah with the wealth and their lives. Hakikat, you, this is actually for you. Not equal are those believers who, remaining at home and the mujahideen who, who strive and fight. Allah had given his absolutely true statement for all times and everyone who hadn't been able to join jihad for right or wrong reasons would have been condemned to eternal hellfire or at least social humiliation. But luckily, by sheer coincidence, a blind man happened to be sitting there who overhears Muhammad dictating this verse to his scribe and he says, but, oh, Prophet, what about me? If I was capable, then I would have joined the jihad. Then this is so comical. Muhammad pretends, eh, I'm getting another revelation, and adds the phrase, other than the disabled. This whole story is written in Tirmidhi 3033. Now, what kind of an all-knowing entity, when giving his final word for all times, forgets such a detail? This is not an isolated incident. There's another hilarious story from the 7th century. <laughs> Those guys were having a lot of fun in the desert. For example, when Allah was explaining in Quran 2, chapter 2, verse 187, how you should fast in the month of Ramadan. He tries to be poetic and didn't realize how much confusion it would create later on. He said, eat until the white thread becomes distinguishable from the black thread. So, so those geniuses over there started putting white and black thre threads on their legs and they would eat until it's bright enough that they could tell them apart. Allah was like, Jesus. <laughs> and then he added the word al-fajr, meaning dawn. Now, this story is also written in Bukhari 4,511. Did the all-knowing God not know this? You would be forgiven if a man made the ma ma makes that statement because, yes, he might not have anticipated it, but an all-knowing God must have known this. These are very basics. Allah was making... Um, even a moderately skilled author like Hakikachu would probably not make that mistake because we know when we write something, we anticipate how the other side might interpret it or how they will counteract it. This happens in our case all the time because we don't claim that we know everything. We write a solution, we do our best, and when a situation arises, we adapt and change accordingly. But the claimant of, of all the knowledge doesn't have this luxury. This all-knowing God is either a cunning liar or not so wise, as he says in Quran 109.6. For you is your religion, for me is mine. If you took it on face value, you'd be like, okay, that's a reasonable offer. But when they came to power, everyone had to either convert to Islam or be exiled. In the Quran, chapter 2, verse 62, Allah in, in his all wisdom says, Jews, Christian, and Sapiens can go to heaven, need not to worry. But when Muhammad realizes he can achieve a lot more, he abrogates it and, and says in the Quran 385, as only Muslims can go to Jannah, non-Muslims will be the losers. Moreover, how many other verses there are where not only ordinary people, but learning, learned scholars of Islam disagree with each other, but they don't have the luxury of a prophet running around who could instantly get a text message from Allah, like in the case of a blind man, who could tell us, oh, no, 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 this is not what I meant, this is what I meant. And Allah knew this problem. This is why in Quran chapter 5, verse 19, he said, I am sending you another prophet, so you don't complain where is our prophet. Well, I'm still complaining. Where's our prophet, Allah? Well, we need another prophet too, because there is so much confusion in the understanding, in understanding Allah's verses, like how much is too much wife beating, for example. Thank you very much for that five minute rebuttal. We'll kick it over to Daniel for his five minute rebuttal as well. Yeah, so Harris, uh, it looks like you're gish galloping. You're just giving all of these random points. Like, can you just specify something that you want me to respond to? It seems like you're just rambling. You know, the topic of the debate is Sharia and human rights, and you're just bringing all these different theological issues. So try to focus. From I gave from you. Sharia. Don't interrupt me. You have specific questions that I gave you clearly that you can respond to on human rights, but you're just bringing up all of these random topics. So on the issue of um, family, look, I'm bringing objective arguments. Unless you want to say that family is not valuable or marriage is not valuable, okay? But otherwise, family and marriage and love, these are valuable things. Objectively, all humans agree. Is living in a strong, stable family with mother, father, grandparents, uncles, and aunts a human right? The vast majority of human beings throughout history and today have lived in these extended families, and countless studies show the psychological and social, sociological benefits of living in strong, stable kinship groups. Other studies show that not having family or living in broken families is associated with 
with higher crime, higher depression, higher drug use, higher suicide rate, higher mental health problems, and so forth. Again, it's easy to understand how emphasis on individual liberty and equality above all else is antithetical to objective family value. Family often requires you to sacrifice your own personal desires for the benefit of kith and kin. Taking care of children or taking care of the elderly are significant burdens. If you constantly tell people that maximum freedom is the most important thing above all else, it's no surprise that people will choose self-interest over family again and again. And eventually the institution of family will die off, which presumably you think is a bad thing, Harris. You might even... You might have even heard this anecdotally from friends who say bluntly, I have my own dreams and ambitions. I can't waste time on children or my parents. This is the anti-family sentiment that has spread like cancer in the modern world, and it's because of prioritizing individual liberty. And all the stats, again, prove it. Just look at average household size. For example, according to Pew, North America and Europe have the smallest average household sizes, whereas the Muslim world has double the household sizes of the of the West. Uh, Pew Research also shows that living alone is more common in wealthier countries, especially North America and Western Europe. Fertility rates are plummeting throughout the modern world. UN report shows that uh, Europe, in Europe, the fertility rate is below replacement, only 1.6 child per woman. Um, the same thing in North America below replacement levels, but Muslim world, it's double or triple those fertility rates. This uh, Another metric that represents the death of family is the rise of single parent households. According to Pew, in the US, about one in four children are in single parent households. In the UK, one in five, and these numbers have dramatically increased over the past 50 years. What this means is that even the very few children that are being born in the developed world live with a single parent, usually the mom, and she of course has to work to make ends meet. So this is not even the nuclear family. Forget about extended family. Even the nuclear family has been destroyed in the modern West. What this means is that realistically, a high percent of, the, of children in the West don't have any family to speak of. No father, no siblings, no grandparents, no cousins surrounding them. Now, I can list for you a bunch of studies that demonstrate that children raised in these single parent households are at increased risk of dropping out of school, increased risk of being incarcerated, doing drugs. Other studies these show children from single family households have double the risk of mental health problems. They're more likely to be abused, more likely to commit suicide, and on and on. And this makes sense from a biological and psychological standpoint. For tens of thousands of years, humans have lived in large families with their own flesh and blood. When you strip that all away, like in the modern human rights West, what's, what's that going to do to people psychologically? What is it going to do to them sociologically? Again, we see Muslims at the opposite end of the spectrum with all of these stats, and this is because of the rules in Islamic law, rules that specify parental rights, known as birr al-walidain, being good to parents, emphasized by, emphasis by the Prophet, peace be upon him, on fertility and having big families, emphasis on kinship rights and duties known as silat al-rahim, emphasis on getting married young, emphasis on taking care of elderly family members, not just dumping him in a nursing home, as is increasingly common throughout the West. And, and also the patriarchal family structure, that is also very important. So these are some of the rules that the liberal human rights regime considers contrary to personal freedom and human rights, but these are the exact same rules that preserve the important human institution of the family. Don't you think families are objectively good, Harris? Then explain why human rights are destroying them. Explain that. We are going to kick it over to the five-minute response from Harris. And I want to remind you, our guests are linked in the description, folks. Go ahead, Harris. Right. So um, you've obviously got a script that you're stuck to. And this is why we have to talk when, uh, when, when the actual discussion starts. But so far, you haven't responded to any of my responses because you haven't spoken anything. You haven't said anything about Sharia. You ha don't interrupt. You haven't said anything about Sharia. I've spoken about your claim is Sharia is objective and I've laid the argument against how it is not objective and you haven't said anything yet um uh, so let's just keep digging further into sharia and then the, the problems that you're pointing out some are valid some are not valid but either way you make a mistake 
claiming that Sharia is somehow the solution. And this is what I'm exposing right now. Sharia is not a solution. So let's talk about the elephant in the room. I'm talking about slavery, which you are a massive proponent of. As I said earlier, not all Muslims have turned off their compassion switch and they go out of their ways to make excuses, such as how Islam promoted compassion, that it set in motion the world where slavery will eventually be abolished. Yes, it's a completely fabricated claim. I agree with you on that. But at least I can understand that they're trying to keep their humanity intact. In fact, this is the same claim modern day Judeo-Christian apologists make as well. But you, Akikachu, don't take that approach because once you have lost all compassion, and humanity, it, it's easier to become a literalist because Quran literally advocates cruel practices like slavery. I wouldn't go into the mainstream slavery, the idea of treating human beings as commodity. That's just, that's just okay for you, yeah? I'm particularly troubled by sex slavery. Islam and Sharia literally allow you to go to a neighboring village, kill their men, and take their women as sex slaves who would clean your house at day and do other things at night. Does this not send shivers down your spine? Is this a solution that you were just offering about the what human rights, what uh, the, the core family is destroyed or something, and this is the alternative that you're offering? Maybe it does to James and every other sane person listening to this, but look how cool you are, Hakikachu, with the possibility. You might be getting turned on by this practice. Quran allows this in multiple places, such as chapter 4, verse 24, 25, chapter 23, verse 6, 24, 31, and many more. How could this not be wicked and cruel? Ordinary Muslims are troubled by this. And I inquired further. If I can't make you feel for other humans that you intend to take as sex slaves, let's reverse the roles. Let's imagine I and my soldiers raid your village, kill you and your male members, and then take your daughters, wives, even mothers as sex slaves. Your women would not just have to deal with the fact that their husbands and sons and fathers have been murdered, but also the same night, they have to deal with having sex with the killers of their fathers and sons and husbands and brothers. Would you be okay with that, Hakikachu? Now, can you answer that one? Maybe you can't feel that for other women who are not related to you, but surely even as a sadist like yourself could feel that for your female family members. If not, then I can only hope that other men who supposedly follow you don't think like you. Some Muslims say, well, you don't have to rape them as though any woman would like to sleep with the very people who have murdered their fathers, brothers, sons, and husbands. This is not some far-fetched case. This is exactly what happened with Rehana bin Tazayed, whose husband was killed by Muhammad's men after the massacre of Banu Qurayza. She refused to marry Muhammad out of respect for her dead husband, but eventually married Muhammad after she got sick of being the slave girl of Muhammad. Moreover, the infamous story of Safiya, when her father, brother, and husband were killed, Safiya was taken as a slave girl, and Muhammad slept with her on the very first night. This was so outrageous that even one of the servants of Muhammad stood guard at the tent. When asked by Muhammad, hey, what are you doing here, boy? Oh, messenger of God, this young woman had just been married, and you killed her father, husband, and brother. So I did not trust her not to harm you. The prophet laughed and said, good. If we film this, imagined it in flesh every saint muslim or not every saint person would be outraged by this behavior this will be how an ultimate villain behaves yet this is the man all you guys practically worship there's so many such stories let's look at this one once abu Sa'd says after the battle of banu al mustalik we came across some captive women we asked the prophet if we should drop our load by load i mean semen in or we pull out the prophet says do what you want allah controls the pregnancy Bukhari, chapter 4, uh, 4138. These captive women were living, breathing human beings. Imagine my soldiers come, come to me and ask me, Oh, General Sultan, whether we should pull out or drop the load in the sisters of so-and-so we have just killed. And you're worried about the falling fertility rate? This also reminds me when Stalin was told about the mass scale rapes of the German women at the hands of the Red Army. Stalin simply said, They've been through a lot. Let them enjoy. This is literally what Muhammad did. In another instant, a guy named by the guy by the name of Salama says he captured the prettiest girl in Arabia. When he took her back to Abu Bakr, he gave her to him as a gift. Sahih Muslim 1755. Slavery is horrible, but sex slavery is even worse. And this merciful <laughs> prophet and his Sharia enabled it. There's so many other stories like this, but I can't pick them all in five minutes. We'll kick it over to Daniel for his five-minute response as well. 
okay, uh, so I'm going to address slavery and sex slavery, but let me just explicit for the be explicit for the audience since Harris doesn't seem to be getting it. I'm arguing that Sharia uh, law is superior to human rights because Sharia rule preserves marriage and family. Okay, and human rights doesn't. It destroys marriage and family and community and the human race. That's the argument. Uh, so let's move on to slavery. Uh, the reality is to win a war in the pre-modern period, it was all about manpower. The main factor in whether your people would live or die was numbers. So this meant that if you won a battle, you couldn't just let the captives go because they would just regroup and attack you again or join your enemies. So you only had two options. You either had to kill or enslave. Neither option is good, right? But that's just the nature of war. You always have to use violence against the other side. You either kill or enslave. So Harris, you want to criticize Islam and call Islam barbaric for having slavery, but imagine if I asked you this question. Do you support using weapons in war? Do you support using guns to shoot people or swords to stab people and kill people? Do you support that? Because all of that is violent. All of that is barbaric. Presumably you'd say, yeah, of course I support weapons and killing because how else are you going to fight war and defend yourself? Well, that's exactly the point with slavery. In the pre-modern period, you couldn't have war without slavery any more than you could have war without weapons and killing. In other words, if killing people can sometimes be justified, then slavery can also sometimes be justified. And this is exactly what your friend, apostate prophet, accepted open, with open arms in our debate last year. Imagine in the future they invent a new technology for war where a laser shoots from space and can directly target any person in the world. And the technology is so precise that there are zero casualties other than the intended target. Then people in this future might look back at our time and say, look how barbaric those people in the 21st century were. Look how barbaric with their tanks and guns and bombs. Would that make any sense? That's exactly what you're doing by criticizing Islam for slavery. You should just acknowledge that slavery could be completely justified in certain circumstances, which, by the way, are the circumstances people have lived in for 99% of human history. Now, if you want to argue that Islam requires enslaving people today, I would say that that is not correct. It depends on the imam. If you read fiqh, Islamic jurisprudence, this is very clear. There's no requirement that people captured in war are enslaved. This is discussed in classical fiqh books. For example, Bidayat al-Mujtahid by Ibn Rushd in the 12th century. Go to Kitab al-Jihad and he summarizes the position of the four Sunni schools of fiqh. The Imam has the option to pardon people and forego taking slaves in war. The Imam does not does not have the option to suspend, for example, hudud punishments for lashing, like lashing for fornicators, but taking slaves is one of those issues where the imam can forego if it's in the best interest of the Muslim community. So in modern times, a hypothetical imam could exercise this option and still be 100% consistent with the most strict understanding of traditional Islamic law. Now, Harris, since you seem to be ignorant about these details about Islamic law, I'll do you a favor and steel man your argument for you. You could respond to me and say, well, Daniel, fine, slavery could be justified in the past, but now with modern technology, modern weapons, uh, clearly slavery could never be justified. That means Islamic rules regarding slavery are not justifiable in our modern context, which means at least one aspect of Islamic law is obsolete. And if one aspect of Islamic law is obsolete due to modern technology, then why not all of Islamic law? This is actually the argument that a lot of Muslim liberal reformists make, but the response to this is simple. In the past, the low level of technology meant that in order to wield political power, war was necessary, which meant that slavery was necessary. The only difference today is there are bombs, nukes, fighter jets, drones, chemical and biological weapons. So now war is not about manpower. Basically, you have to believe that these new technologies are such a blessing and we're better off because at the very least, no one needs slavery to de defend themselves, right? We live in a world of nukes and drones and weapons of mass destruction. So slavery is no longer needed. So the question is, is this actually a better world? Well, the harms associated with modern technologies like nukes and drones and mass surveillance, and you can't go to the bathroom without security agencies constantly monitoring your every move and every communication, these harms are far, far greater than the harms that existed in Islamic slavery. Frankly, these modern technologies are more terrifying. We have to look at the whole package. Which is the better world? One with the constant threat of nukes, nuclear annihilation, and constant terrorizing of the world's poor people with trillion-dollar weapons programs? Let's ask the... 
uh, people of Nagasaki and Hiroshima, or the Vietnamese children with horrifying birth defects because of chemical weapons like Agent Orange. Let's ask the Palestinian and Syri Syrian refugees or children who are being burned alive with white phosphorus. In light of these modern technological horrors, the practice of Islamic slavery actually seems a far better alternative in the context of war, even if it were practiced today. Thank you very much. Five minute response from Harris, go ahead. Right. Um, no, slavery wasn't abolished because of uh, the modern day warfare. Um, uh, slavery was the reason that we don't have slavery is because the enlightenment forced us to realize that owning other human beings is not a good idea. Now that is just the outcome of that. Anyway, I always used to wonder how could people believe in war and a certain idea and are always propagating it. But when it comes to doing it themselves, they don't do it whether that's George W. Bush or Trump or our very own Hakikachu. These guys are okay to propagate wars and revolutions, but when it comes to taking, taking action, they run away. Trump made health excuses and so did George W. Bush, but our friend Hakikachu also makes similar excuses to get out of it. Why does he not go to Afghanistan or Syria to fight for ISIS or Taliban? If you say, well, they're not truly Islamic, then go there. It's definitely much closer to Muhammad or your true Islam than America is. But no, I'm keen to see what excuses you make this time. Hakikachu likes to present himself as not like any other apologist. He says, he says it as it is. He doesn't hold back. If Islam condones violence, he says, yes, yeah, so what? It, so what? It is what it is. But when it comes to fighting the holy war or application of Sharia, he doesn't actually do anything. At least those jihadis who went to Syria to fight for ISIS were honest. Osama bin Laden, who gave up his life of luxury, was honest. They were literalist and honest. Hakikachu is only a literalist and honest as long as he is sitting in his nice suburban home in America watching Muslim apologists debate on 70-inch TVs. And so is the case with all these trolls who is following Hakikachu enjoys. They stay at home, probably enjoy welfare payments, but buy nice cars and enjoy shisha at night. Voila, life is good, everything's sorted, but let's curse the West. Look what Prophet Muhammad said about people like Hakikachu. Not equal among the believers who sit and the Mujahideen who fight for Allah, Tirmidhi 3033. Look what the Quran says. Fighting is enjoyed upon you, enjoined upon, upon you. While it is hard on you, it could be that you dislike something when it is good for you. Quran, chapter 2, verse 216. This is directly for you, Hakikachu. I remember Apostate Prophet asked uh, you the same question, Hakikachu. You simply said, well, I have my family here. How bloody convenient. So are you saying that those people who used to go to jihad would take their families with them? This is what Prophet Muhammad said about the family. The Prophet said, none of you will have faith till he loves me more than his father, his children, and all mankind, Bukhari 15. So, Hakikachu, you, 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 you want to get into answering questions, answer this question. Do you love your parents and your family more than you love your love the prophet? So, you got to pick up your love for, you, you, you got to give up your love for nice, comfy beds, big TVs, halal cheeseburgers, or kebabs, maybe, and get off your backside and go set an example. Fight! For what you believe in you had the perfect opportunity to go to syria or afghanistan to fight for your cause but you chose to sit in your nice house in america whose economy runs on interest and according to you guys spilling the blood of innocent muslims in afghanistan and iraq being allies of israel like jews you are basically living and enjoying the perks of a country that is literally the enemy of muslims like afghanistan it cannot be clearer than this. It's like Muslims are fighting the Kufars of Quraysh, and here you are saying, nah, I'm just going to sit in my house in Mecca. You are willing to run the risk of raising your children in this evil society that is more than likely going to corrupt your children. They might fall into the trap of the Western lifestyle, like going out, partying, drinking, having premarital sex, all the horrible things that you worry about. I actually know some of some modest Muslim families who leave Western countries. Just when the children are about to hit the ages of 10 or 11, they go back, citing their fears just mentioned. Like they used to show in the cartoons, um, you know, when you look at yourself in the mirror, don't you see a jackass? You know, like, that, that's how I feel. You, you must feel like that at some point. We have got another five-minute response coming in from Daniel. Thanks so much. The floor is all yours. 
Okay, Haras is completely misrepresenting Islamic law. In Islamic law and the Sharia, there is no obligation at all times to fight jihad, and there's no obligation at all times to take slaves or sex slaves. This is a complete misrepresentation. Haras needs to study Islamic law and fiqh because he's clearly ignorant. He has this kind of, uh, you know, George Bush in understanding of Islam or Donald Trump understanding of Islam, where it's just about killing and murdering. This is like from in intelligence agencies, basically. You think ISIS is Islam. Nowhere have I endorsed ISIS or said that, yeah, they're the true uh, representation of Islam. You are simply misrepresenting. And so it's a complete straw man. All you're doing is straw man arguments, and you can't even respond to any of the points that I made. I responded to your point about slavery, and now I'm going to respond to the point of sex slavery. But I just want to make one other point. Why don't you, Harris, you want me to get off my backside and go to Afghanistan while that country is being bombed and being threatened by the United States and uh, just getting out of a 20-year brutal occupation with, mil with thousands of deaths and rapes? Why don't you tell your followers, Harris, all these followers that you have in Pakistan and India, all these uh, Murtads like you, tell them to move to Botswana. Why don't you tell them to move to Botswana, tell them to move to Haiti, because Botswana and Haiti, they have LGBT rights, they have women's rights. Why are they in Muslim countries? You should tell them to move to Botswana and Haiti. And in fact, it would be a more favorable position than Muslims moving to Afghanistan, because if, they, if your followers move to Botswana, Pakistan wouldn't bomb Botswana. Pakistan wouldn't try to uh, agitate in Botswana and try to get them to adopt Sharia or Islamic law. They would be able to live their free lives with human rights and LGBT rights and women's rights. Why don't you do that, Harris? Is it because you're a con man? Is it because you're dishonest? You're not telling your followers in none of your videos, hey guys, human rights are great. Move from a Muslim country like Pakistan or Bangladesh and go to Botswana and Haiti. You never say that. So you're a hypocrite. You are a con man. Now let me get to the point about sex slavery. A good book I recommend is Lawrence Keeley's War Before Civilization. He explains that pre-modern war was primarily about manpower. The side that had the largest army was usually going to win. And if you had too few people, this made you an easy target for a larger group to attack you and wipe you out. This meant that women were very valuable in pre-modern societies because your society's ability to reproduce and build up the population is limited by the number of fertile wombs you have. Keeley says, and I quote, although the loss of even a large percentage of males will have no direct influence on a group's demographic fortunes, the loss of or gain of fertile women can mean the difference between population decline and growth. This is why Keeley argues all pre-modern civilizations took sex slaves. Again, this was a necessary aspect of war. If you did not take concubines, you were at a major disadvantage militarily because you either take concubines or your people get wiped off the face of the earth. There is no third option. So given that stark reality, yes, taking sex slaves was not only morally justified, it was morally necessary. And really, that's enough for the argument, but it's worth noting that the Sharia's rules on concubines and slaves in general are the most humane out of any other civilization. Again, slavery is not supposed supposed to be a fun time, but Islam explicitly gives slaves many rights. They can't be mutilated, they can't be killed, they can't be prostituted. For women, if she gives birth to her master's baby, the baby is free, and she also is freed automatically when her master dies. These rules ensured that captured slaves very quickly integrated within larger Islamic society, especially after one or two generations. Contrast this with other societies in history that maintain a permanent subjugated slave class based on race or ethnicity. Islamic slavery is not like that. And that's why we see, for example, the Mamluks in the Middle Ages who were a ruling class of Muslim slaves and the descendants of slaves, some of whom even reached the level of sultans and emirs in the Muslim caliphate as slaves. So the argument is very simple, Harris, but you haven't responded to anything that I've said. All you're doing is gish galloping, bringing in all, everything except the kitchen sink, misrepresenting straw man. And I think the audience sees that. You don't, I have a very simple argument. Sharia preserves marriage and family and community and the human race overall. And I'm bringing statistics, objective statistics, that if you 
think that family and marriage is not valuable, then, then say that. Say that you don't think it's valuable, so we know. But otherwise, I'm bringing objective arguments, and you haven't responded to any of my questions. Kick it over for a five-minute response from Harris Sultan. And in case you didn't see it in the live chat, there is a poll, folks. Feel free to take that poll and go ahead, Harris. It's funny that you say no obligation to join jihad. How convenient for you, yeah? But where, where is the longing to, to work for your God, work for your religion, to spread the word of Allah? Where, where is the longing for that? No. Yeah, that, that nice comfy couch is much better than why why go for jihad in Afghanistan. You didn't praise ISIS, I know that, but you did praise Taliban. Uh, why don't I move to Botswana or Haiti? Well, because um, the, the, we human rights is not the only thing. It's just a part of the package. It's not the whole package. So there are so much other, so many other things that you want to get. Botswana mm -hmm. and Haiti probably don't take refugees either. Um, and why would you not want to go to a country where you can where, where you can maximize pleasure and you live your life to its maximum? Um, so I think that that was easy to respond and take that long. Anyway, now let's talk about the rights. Sharia gives to women. I'm sure you have a script written for that too, because you knew I would bring that up. Needless to say that their statement is worth half of that of a man, meaning they're not equal. Quran 2, 2, 8, 2. They get half of the inheritance compared to the male counterparts. Quran 4, 11. Female captives can be used as sex slaves. But above all, the biggest setback for women, especially Muslim women, is that their male counterparts can physically discipline them as Quran 4, 34 instructs. Forget about how Muslims interpret this verse, but its true manifestation can be seen from one of your own videos where once a Muslim, not, not an atheist, not an ex-Muslim, a Muslim who hadn't turned off his compassion switch, like you have told, like you have, told you, this is not how Muslims treat women like you do. And you replied to him by asking, don't you want a woman who obeys you? Yes, you need an obedient servant. Not an equal life partner with whom you build a relationship of trust, love on the basis of equality. Yes, you have this, your own worldview of, uh, of preserving family and marriage and fertility rate and all that. Is this how you want to do it? You know what? Probably better if human, uh, human race goes extinct. You build it upon how much she obeys you. Cook me dinner. Okay, husband. Wash my clothes. Okay, husband. If you fear disobedience from her, you can beat her up as per the Quran. Societies that build upon concepts like human rights will outlaw this because they say human rights, not man's rights alone. My partner or wife will simply say, go cook your own food. And I'll be like, OK, honey, in your article, my sister, you were talking about violence against women. And you said people who commit violence against women, you would only say that don't leave them in a room with you, which is a respectable position to take. But honest, is it according to your worldview? Is it honest? Would you beat up the second caliph, Umar bin Khattab, who beat up Abu Bakr's sister when she wouldn't stop crying? Aisha even forbade Umar's vagabond, what was his name, um, anyway, whatever his name was, from entering her house. But he said, go in and bring me the daughter of Abu Kuwafa, Hisham was his name, went in and brought her out where Umar bin Khattab gave her a number of blows as recorded in Ibn Hisham, page 137 to 138. There are actually quite a few stories where Umar actually acted like a total tool. For example, once Umar saw a Persian slave girl wearing a scarf that belonged to Anas, and Umar gave her a number of blows saying, don't assume the manners of free women. Al-Albani in his book, Arwal Ghalil, volume 6, page 204, declared the narration as perfect. Once Ashad bin Qas went to stay at Umar's house, and he woke up in the middle of the night. When he heard Omar beating the hell out of his wife, when he tried to stop Omar, guess what Omar said? Omar said, Prophet, peace be upon him, told me never ask a man when he's beating his wife. So in Ibn Majah 1986. I want to know what would happen if you were left alone in, in the room with Omar. You like to say that you don't want to be left alone with those people because I'm assuming that you're not going to sit down and pay, play Monopoly with them. You're going to probably give them some... Some, uh, some of the taste of their own medicine, or would you not? Or you might just worm your way out of it by saying, well, he was the enforcer of Allah's command, and so all's fair. Sure, if that's the way you want to go, I'll just leave it to the people to decide which world they would want to live in, because the society I live in ensures even a criminal doesn't get tortured to extract information. You got it. We'll go to a five minute response from Daniel. And a couple of things, folks, shortly, just a little bit here, we'll be going into the open dialogue and also just did a poll interesting to see we asked what people identify as we had 41 percent identify as muslim then 36 percent atheist 
other 11%, and then Christian was 10%, which we're excited about having that kind of variety of people. We do hope you feel welcome, no matter what walk of life you're from. And with that, go ahead, Daniel, the floor is all yours for five minutes. Okay, again, um, Harris is just gish galloping. He's throwing everything out there. I'm going to actually respond with arguments. I'll just respond to this uh, wife beating argument. Um, you know, simple question, Harris. Uh, do you believe women should be subject to laws? If you do believe that women should be subject to laws, then that means you believe women should be subject to all kinds of violence, including being beaten, jailed, even executed. That's what it means to be subject to the law. So there really is no difference between Islam on quote-unquote wife beating and human rights on this issue. Both Islam and human rights are in 100% agreement that women are accountable if they break the law. And that means Islam and human rights are in 100% agreement that women should be beaten. We only differ on who should do the beating. You say only the state. Only the state can punish women. Only the state should have a monopoly on all power and authority. Islam says, no, power should be distributed across kinship groups. And this means that the patriarch has authority to physically discipline members of his family, including his wives, if they violate important norms and values. Now let's ask women, if you violate the law, shouldn't you face consequences? And if you have to face consequences, who would you rather mete out those consequences? The cold iron fist of the bureaucratic technocratic state or the person who loves you the most in the whole world? The other important difference is that with the technocratic state, there is no higher authority. If the authoritarian modern state wants to persecute a particular woman she has no recourse beyond the authority of the state but in islam the husband is not the highest authority if he is unjust to his wife or if he causes serious abuse then the wife can take him to the islamic court and get paid damages or she can complain to her extended family and make her case so that other patriarchs can intervene and actually punish her uh, husband. This is an organic system and we see similar systems in all traditional cultures, Native American culture, even Christianity, read the Bible, even Judaism, read the Bible. They all have these kinds of rules. Nowadays, they've, they've kind of reformed all of that. Islam is the only religion that's really honest on this. Look, let me put it like this. Is it possible to run a corporation without the possibility of physical discipline? No. You have to give managers in these corporations the right to beat their employees. How do you beat your employees? Well, if the employee violates the norms of the workplace, they get fired. And if they do not voluntarily comply, security will be call called to remove them by force. Managers have to have the right to beat their employees. If they didn't have the right, you couldn't have a hierarchical organization. Islam recognizes this about family. Patriarchy is hardwired into our DNA. Neurobiologists, psychologists, they all acknowledge this. Women are naturally hypergamous, which means they're attracted to men who are stronger than them and higher status than them. Men that they can be dependent on, men that are authorities over them. If you take out the patriarchy, this actually significantly reduces female attraction to their husbands. And they have studies on this where they ask women if they are more attracted to the macho man patriarch or a man who is at their same level in terms of size, strength, and status. And all women, including the hardcore feminists, prefer the higher status male. So if you promote egalitarian marriage, such as in human rights, you basically are ensuring less attraction, and that means less stable marriages. And this exact, is exactly why marriages in the modern West have collapsed, because they're egalitarian. Islam says, no, if you want a strong society, you have to have strong families. And if you, have, and if you want strong families, they have to be patriarchal. And if they're patriarchal, that means the man has authority. And if he has authority, that means he has the power to physically maintain order. 
this is all a coherent holistic system and it's backed and underwritten by human biology human psychology that is universal across all human societies it's hardwired into us that's why this is an objective argument harris you can't really understand that i hope your followers these christians who are listening these hindus that are listening i hope they're following because this stuff is in their books as well in their cultures as well they've reformed all that and threw it out because they're cucking to modernity but muslims are not going to do that we don't need to change our religion because it's revealed from god to the creator of human beings the creator of human beings knows our psychology knows our biology and that's why he has revealed this sharia this sharia for the benefit and flourishing of humanity and all of the statistics are proving this you can't even respond to a single one go ahead harris for five minutes all right okay so let's just go through some of his points he says uh, so would i want women to subject to law of course i would want them to subject to law if they commit a crime they need to go to prison but where you but then you well, extended refuse. it now this is no well, sorry please don't interrupt i mean i uh, yeah, as painful as it was listening to your babble but then you know i i, I, I kept my uh, patience there so but you said you extended your seventh century mentality or your or, or, or your backward mentality saying that so that means they would be subject to beatings and tortured and even sentenced to death hello have you even heard what we're talking about human rights us human rights activists we don't support sentence to death we don't support torture like the torture of kinana and those on those men that that prophet muhammad said that go and drink camel urine but like we don't support that beating we don't support that so there is imprisonment which is within reason. Yes, it's not ideal, but this is within reason. But at least we don't support torture. Yes, I know that. If I beat a donkey, the donkey would probably be tamed. And this is the same mentality that you guys invent, applied on human beings. A powerful person applies a force to scare them, intimidate them, and gets them under, the, under their thumb. Yes, we know that. It does work. Duh, it does work. But should it work? Because now we're not thinking about the powerful, we're thinking about the weak. This is why we're saying, no, women should not be beaten. Now you say, okay, so who would you rather have them? So I've already said that we wouldn't be beating torture centers to death, just subject to law, meaning humane laws, such as imprisonment, uh, with a full chance of parole and rehabilitation, and not to seek vengeance. Only, um, uh, so who would you want them to punish, uh, punish by? Well, the state or someone who loves them. I almost, you know, I had to mute my mic when you said that, or who, who loves them. Like a husband loves you. Baby, I love you, but you, you know, left the, left your uh, clothes uh, outside and it rained again. Boom. That's what you mean, love? This is what you're saying? No, Daniel, as I said, this is not uh, in accordance with, uh, with our worldview of human rights. Um, you said, um, what was the pathetic analogy that you gave that was about what uh, you could beat the employees? Okay, again, see, you have to work on your analogies as well because you said beat the employees. And I was thinking, what? Which corporations are beating their employees? But then you were using that as a synonym for firing them. There's a huge difference between firing someone and physically beating them. Yes, if you drag someone again, that is a different action. It's not equivalent of beating. It's like... What is worse, coughing, pushing, shoving, or actually cutting off someone's hand or a full-on fist in someone's face? These things are very simple to understand, but you can't understand that because you can't get your mind out of the 7th century ideology. Um, there, there are a few other points that you made earlier, but I think we, we will probably open it up for back-to-back -back conversation. I think that would make it more interesting viewing for everyone. You got it. We've got one more five-minute response. That's from Daniel, and then we'll go right into that open dialogue. Wait, do I, not, do I get more time because he had the 20-minute opening? So it is true that you would get, given that Harris started and yield. Well, actually, well, one thing is he actually he didn't take the full 20 minutes. He took six. Yeah, I didn't. Um, so no. you would get an extra minute. So what we can do, so if you go back, the recording of his opening statement, and if, if people really want to check, because I am keeping the time on every statement. James, that's okay. James, that's oh, hold okay. Hold on a second. Daniel, I'm still talking. Have, hold on a second. I'm still talking. Time. Hold on. So, is that, so he did have one extra minute during that opening, and so you would get one extra minute added on to your five-minute response if you'd like. Sure. I, I'd like that, please. So, in other words, he asked for 20 minutes, but he only used 16 minutes in his opening. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. Just an extra minute. That's fine. 
you got it. All right, thanks, James. Uh, okay, so first of all, Harris is saying that the state doesn't torture and abuse people. Hello, didn't you hear all that statements I made about colonialism? How the state is genociding people, torturing people, raping women. The state powers, the human rights nations that you're defending in this whole debate, Harris, have raped how many women have imprisoned how many women have tortured through solitary confinement and war waterboarding how many women okay so <laughs> you are a totalitarian because you only trust the state to have this kind of power in islam men can't uh, uh torture their wives in islam men can't according to the sharia men cannot you know even physically hurt their wives in, in a permanent kind of way and you're you don't it's clear that you don't understand the employee employer example because in most cases the employee if the employer says your manager says do this uh you are part of an organization there's a hierarchy and there's a relationship between the manager and the employee so the manager says you know we need to get this done and everyone works together there's no need to call security and physically remove right by force and use a nightstick or a gun or a taser to remove employees similarly in islamic law uh that that kind of thing doesn't happen it only happens rarely rare uh, as rare as it would be for these corporations to physically remove and taser their employees so this there's complete parallel here between any because you have to have uh the ability to enforce uh, structure and norms with any hierarchical organization and Islam is just saying that families have that kind of authority and the patriarch has that kind of authority it's not unfettered authority it's not unchecked authority but he has that in the same way that many institutions hierarchical institutions in the modern world west human rights respecting West, they have those kinds of authorities and the right to beat people as well. The only difference is you think that only the state, only the totalitarian, bureaucratic, technocratic state should have those kinds of rights. So th there's not really a substantive difference there, and we can talk about it more if you need more explanation. But... Um, Look, I just want to emphasize, we have seen how the extremist liberal doctrine of individual liberty at all costs threatens marriage, family, community. But really, this extremism threatens the very nature of humanity itself. Through the use of technology, modern liberal states now claim that people have the right to change their gender. If you don't want to be one gender, you can use technology to change it. Even children as young as three should have this option, according to the gender and sexu sexuality experts who operate at the highest levels of academia in the Western world and government. But even beyond gender, people are now given the choice to change their species. Some people feel that they're not actually human, but they're actually cats or dogs deep down inside. Nowadays, certain surgeries can be used to physically alter bodies to transition people to their desired appearance. This is what philosophers like Yuval Harari call transhumanism. But gender and species transition is just the tip of the iceberg. You think they're going to stop with gender transition for kindergartners? No, no, no. They're just getting started. Imagine this human rights argument. When when babies are born with a certain set of genitalia that could negatively that could negatively impact their gender identity later on we need to make sure to genetically alter all fetuses so that everyone is born with without any particular set of genitalia that way everyone can choose their gender more easily and seamlessly when they're older that's in line with maximum liter liberty and maximum <coughs> equality do you have a problem with forcibly altering fetuses to be born without genitalia that means you're a transphobe that means you're a bigot that means you're against equality and human rights or imagine this argument men naturally have more testosterone which makes them more prone to violence and rape it also makes them physically bigger than women in stature so we need to create a law which forces men to take treatments to decrease their testosterone ideally babies can be genetically modified so that everyone is born with the same exact amount of testosterone that way we can eliminate rape we can eliminate domestic violence and also make make men equal to women in terms of physical size and strength you're not pro-rape, are you? You're not pro-domestic violence, are you? Then you better support these mandatory genetic modifications, otherwise you're violating equality and women's rights. 
All kinds of drugs and technologies can be used to fundamentally alter our psychologies, our genetics, our biology, all in the name of maximizing individual liberty and equality. And this is already happening. Just watch the news. There are no limits. This extremist, liberal human rights ideology is set to destroy the human race itself. And Islam is the only religion and the only community that is pushing back and saying, no, we want to be human beings. We want to preserve our marriages, our families, our community, our humanity. We don't want this never-ending nightmare of human rights. No, thank you. We need to be clear here. This is not a debate about Sharia rejects freedom and equality versus human rights accepts them. This is really a debate about should we have restrictions on freedom and equality in order to preserve other important values versus no limits, freedom and equality extremism of Harris. That is what this debate is really about. Harris, Harris is selling you this extremism and it's, it's exactly like the child that only eats candy. That child is eventually going to die just like these liberal societies are dying terrible deaths. But Sharia is the balanced meal and that's why we need Sharia. You got it. And with that, we're going to jump into open conversation. Want to let you know several things, folks. In particular, our guests are linked in the description. So if you want to hear more from either Daniel or Harris, you certainly can by clicking on those links below. And that includes in the podcast as we put our guest links there as well in each podcast episode of the debate. Also, very exciting tonight, a good old Flat Earth versus Globe Earth debate, as well as next week, very exciting, a debate on biblical ethics as Dr. Josh and Skylar return. It's going to be amazing. So hit that subscribe button for many more debates to come. And with that, we're going to jump into open conversation. I trust you, gentlemen. You're professional. You guys are easygoing, and I think it's going to go well. So open dialogue. The floor is all yours, guys. Right, yeah, so, so do you um, want to respond to any of my points? Do you want to respond to the well, Botswana that, question? Explain, what does human rights really offer, Harris? What human rights offer? Maximizing pleasure, reducing suffering, and well-being of humanity. No, you said maximizing pleasure, but that conflicts with the well-being of humanity. No, That's why I just... just, why I just okay, do you value yeah. marriage? Do you value family? I, I value family, yes. Of okay, then, I value family. then how are you not seeing the death of family in the world okay. all over? With I, yeah, because, I read all because, those stats, yeah, so because, tell me. Yeah, because, no, no, you, but some of your stats, I don't know, I haven't been able to verify that, I don't take your word for it. But um, what you're saying about family, which family are you talking about? One man having four families. The, the whatever family challenges that we could have in the Western world as a result of low, falling fertility rate, I also quoted Pew result, which said that um, Would that you say it was as, a good thing? As women, listen to that, as, well, well, for different reasons though, but as Muslims get more and more advanced, more education, the, the, their level of income goes up, their f fertility is also falling down. And also, yeah, as it's a bad you thing. say, you say, One sec, one, just no. to let Harris finish, sir. It, 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 it has to be, there has to be a balance. Well, 2.2 would be a good balance. Every, every forecast of the world's population says that we can't even keep growing indefinitely and 10 billion might be the absolute critical and we will start falling down after that. So these things, these challenges will, will, will come. There's nothing absolute. That is our argument. There's nothing absolute. What you advocate for, Daniel, you say that this is absolute. This is how it is. This is how it's supposed to be. You made a you, you made a point about slavery, you, you, uh, like the other one that you, you said, well, it's not obligatory to, to go jihad. So, okay, this is comfortable for you. Um, and uh, owning slave is not obligatory either. But it wasn't abolished. It wasn't abolished by that. No person can defend, and, I, and to, to the best of my ability, and please, I'll, I'll, I would like to hear your response on that too. You actually were pro-slavery. You were saying that you could even bring back slavery. So why would you... How could anyone defend having slavery and, uh, and owning other people? What about the families of those people? I mean, they're always going to live beneath the master's, master's heel. So, I, I mean, I, I, so you whatever agree? challenges that you have. So you have, all, challenges this concern, you have yeah. all this concern about uh, families, how they're treated with Islam through warfare, with slavery and so forth. What about all of the destruction to families uh, by colonialism? by uh, modern neocon warfare, by the invasions and occupations of Afghanistan and Iraq and Libya and Vietnam, the Vietnamese, Vietnam War, all of these things, 
you just want to sweep under the carpet? How about we talk about the millions of people that were killed because of forced famines, because of British colonialism, the same British colonialism that was trying to spread human rights and civilization and enlightenment to the subcontinent. Your ancestors faced that kind of genocide and that kind of forced famine. And here, you don't want to stand by that? Tell us where you stand on colonialism because you've avoided that question. You just want to talk about, oh, Muslims uh, are barbaric because we practiced slavery. I gave you the argument for why that was not only morally uh, justified, it was morally necessary. And all of these other cultures practiced it. All of these other religions condoned it. I cited you, Lawrence Keeley, an academic who explains exactly why you have to have it to survive. Otherwise, you're going to be wiped off the face of the earth. You, ha you haven't addressed any of these things. And I just want to ask you, when you say that, okay, fine, uh, our uh, fertility rates I'm are... Gonna forget, I'm going to forget all your points. I mean, if you're asking me these questions, I can respond there very quickly. We can go back and forth very quickly. Um, it, it's up to you. I'm, I'm, I'm just I'm, more you talk, about the more you talk, better it is for me. Okay, then I'll keep talking. The fertility rate issue... One more, one more <laughs> so, point to add on, because it's also a challenge for the audience to follow all the points. We'll give you okay, one more, sure. Daniel, and then we'll kick it over to, to Harris right after. Okay, sure. I, I don't want to monopolize. Sorry about that. Uh, no but just to say about, your, about the fertility issue, you're saying that, okay, look, this is happening. It's below replacement levels in most of these Western developed countries. That means the population is going to go extinct. Like this is literally an existential threat. So you say, okay, we need to get up to 2.2. What are you going to suggest to do that? What kind of policies? Because you have to have a policy that's not voluntary because people are not voluntarily choosing to get uh, married now. They're not voluntarily choosing to have families now. So what policy are you going to introduce? And that's going to limit people's individual freedom and individual choice, right? So give a suggestion. Okay, that's very easy. I mean, uh, let, let's start with the first one. You, you, you said that you want my position on colonialism. And as you said, my ancestors actually suffered at the hands of it. Uh, now I'm wondering which colonialism are you talking about? Arab co colonialism or British colonialism? Is, is a, I'm assuming it's very you different. Would be, we can, you, would be, you want me to talk well, and now, the difference? No, <laughs> what, no well, we, I'll, can, I'll we, we know we know we know one belonged to even more primitive society and that brought slavery and sex slavery whereas the other one brought other kind of suffering but that didn't include slavery so british didn't enslave people of india so thank you very much we know that but yes i'm not pro slavery i don't care about slavery yes we, we condemn slavery this this was the cause of suffering of enormous amount of people including my ancestors in india um so i i, I don't understand why you put that on me as though and you make an argument that okay they were they were going in the name of spreading enlightenment. You know, the human rights. Yes, the enlightenment started uh, post Renaissance period, and then 18th century. You could go in, into the industrial um, revolution time. We could go from anywhere, but it took nearly 200 years to filter down to where we are. Even the postmodernism was actually a result of the of the catastrophic First and Second World War, despite of having League of Nations, despite of having some understanding of enlightenment and despite of pro propagating human rights, but that was still not working. But that is our argument. These things evolve over time and we are consequently getting better and better and better with each, we used to say with each hundred years or probably a, a millennia back in the uh, further back we go. But now it seems like we're getting better and better with, e with each passing decade. Yes, you raised some good points about um, uh, this uh, uh, gender change and all Thank of you. that. Yes, these things are these things are problematic. We know that. But again, no Thanks one is rolling rights. over and but but no 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 no. But that's over, overly simplification of human rights because that's not all human rights says. And uh, the the pre part of what human rights says a big part of what it. what modern what modernism is what modernism is, which is scientific inquiry and reason. Uh, uh, using reason to come up with better solutions that is modernism and now this is we're, we're in postmodernism, and not all postmodernism is bad either this is there you can nitpick anything just like i nitpick your slavery and sex slavery issue wife beating and then you try to make excuses unlike you i am honest well in some cases maybe you are honest but you're not entirely honest yet even though they say you are the honest one but we'll see um but I'm saying that there are some problems, and we know that these problems exist. No, but so, the main problem uh, is that you can't spread these values without total war. 
No, that's the, that's no. the whole point. No. So you Daniel, have to say that that's necessary and that's no, that's Daniel. justified. How no. are you going to how are you going to get the Afghan I'll, people I'll, in I'll Afghanistan to, to follow I'll, I'll. human rights? You're complaining constantly well, about Afghanistan. So how are those people going to accept human rights and democracy as you propose? I mean, we, the answer because. from the U.S. state is clear. They invaded and occupied for 20 years, brutal occupation. And now even after they're gone, you have uh, Anthony Blinken, the secretary of state, saying we're going to agitate and we're going to pressure Afghanistan to start accepting LGBT rights and women's rights. And if they don't comply, we're going to you know, put, put the pressure on them. So this is all force and it leads to suffering. Right. You stand by all that or no? Answer. I'll, no, I'll answer that to you. But uh, yes or no, if you, you stand me, by it or no? If you, yes if or you no. answer me, if you it, it, no, it's more complicated than that. Okay. But if you answer that, do you support <laughs> Taliban or not? You said brutal, you said brutal occupation. Uh, you could argue about the way the war on terror was started, but after that, um, America was not there. There was no Governor General of America. There, there was no this America was in the, Afghanistan. There was no government that was directly American. The government <laughs> itself was Afghan. The government was Afghan. Yes, you could you could laugh yeah, at they're, democracy. They're Afghan. Know, they they yeah. weren't they weren't you're, agents of. Look at all of the leaks that were posted by the Washington Post. You say it's brutal. Post. They were agents. You say it's brutal. Afghan government you say it's, was an agent of the U.S. government. How can you deny that historical you say, fact? You say you say you say it was brutal and put put a hand on your heart and say it was it was more brutal than the 90s Afghanistan or even now yes, what it was Afghanistan more brutal. is going yes, to Yes, I did a whole it video. Was more brutal than that. Okay, I did a 45 right, minute video on all right. the rape, all the right. um, you know, all of the rape and torture and murder. You had Australia, you're an Australian, right? So you had Australian special forces who were hunting farmers, Isolated Afghan incidents. horses and cutting Isolated off their incidents. fingers. No, this is a pattern of abuse. They Isolate. stopped they were counting. punished. They stopped. They were punished. Why were they, they even were punished? There? You they just were, said that there no, was no but, presence. But now were, you're saying they were punished no, no, but, or isolated. So there, there were soldiers. They there, were, right? So why are you changing your we, story? Because no, I'm not changing my story. You said that there weren't there anyone. There was no forces I'm in prepared. Afghanistan, right? I'm saying were no. I didn't say that. I said the well, government. Sorry, well, I said the government. I said the government was Afghanistan. I said the government was Afghanistan. The government was given back to Afghan people, and there was it was an attempt to democracy. Unfortunately. Unfortunately, unfortunately, Islam got in the way and it said, no, sorry, we want to live in the 7th century and we, we want to be ruled by warlords, terror, intimidation and fear and executions and barbarity. And uh, democracy has no place in Afghanistan. You should be everyone else, every sane person, not you. That would be an unexpected expectation from you. Um, uh, not everyone would be happy in Afghanistan. We've seen the footages of people trying to escape Afghanistan. Why? Burqa sales have gone through the roof in Afghanistan. Uh, people are scared. Women came out and women were beaten up. Just yesterday, there was a news story. This people the, are trying the, to the escape El Salvador down. and Mexico. People we are do, trying to escape all, reasons, let's all let, of these countries. Let's let, let's let Harris other reasons. this point. I promise we'll come right back to you. Harris, if you sorry, want to make sorry. this last point, and then we'll kick it back over. I, 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 yeah, because Daniel made all these points. So anyway, so, so yeah, people are escaping those. Yes, I know if, Afghanistan, if America says that everyone at the, uh, at the Lahore or Mumbai airport um, goes they will go there but no we know that for a fact that they're leaving for different reasons people are scared in afghanistan for good reasons because we know what taliban have done you said something about um uh, how would you in, uh, we will go towards extinction and how would you um increase the in, increase the uh, fertility rate and you offered a solution that you can only Im impose these um these policies by war like i mean you literally want to beat people up and invade a country and that's tell them to have sex and make more babies no that's not what did, i said did, didn't so what, what did you say so i want to understand i want to strong man when you say that you have to implement islam has yeah. these policies right uh in the, in the sharia you you um, can't have premarital sex. You can't have extramarital sex. You have modesty. You have gender separation. You encourage um, Muslims to marry young and have children and be fertile. Those are all policies within the Sharia that when people abide by them, there is higher fertility. You have stronger families. You have healthier societies because of that. That, that was the argument. It's not yeah. going to war. No, but you see, but you implied that how you asked me a question. How am I going to apply that in the yeah. Western world where fertility rates are falling? So you, what uh, policy, you didn't say that. What, what policy are you going to institute that will increase what fertility policy? rate? Well, well for, first of all, immigration is the one one good policy, and uh, we can always uh, <laughs> bringing in Muslims from, from other countries. countries. Well, well, there are a lot of Indian and Chinese too, so I would prefer them first. Um, <laughs> but no, Muslims. So that are fine means as that well. the Muslims people are, here Muslims are going are to go extinct. People. 
<laughs> Muslims are good people. No, that's not even the case. I mean, um, uh, for example, Australia pumped up the fertility rate back in the uh, late 2000, uh, early 2010s by giving out baby bonuses. So, you know, you'll get a $10,000 check if you make more babies. Uh, so that's, so your, your policy types. of immigration relies they, on Islam, right? You haven't given a policy. Not necessarily. Because it's Chinese Islam's Muslims? higher fertility or Chinese or any Chinese of these traditional societies. Or Indian Muslims. Yeah, you're That's relying that, on no, but Islam. So you you've just deferred the argument. You haven't introduced a no. policy that will increase well, have, the population, baby bonus. the fertility, ten thousand dollars indigenous population. So you you haven't baby really bonus. introduced the pop. Like the problem baby. that you're having is you can't introduce any policy because it will restrict not, individual freedom. That's why you're stuck. Okay, so, so exactly again, let me tell stuck. you. Let, let me let me go back to Pew again. Let me go back to Pew again because as I said, it's got nothing to do with actual not having, not wanting to make families or whatever. It might have some part to do with it, no, but I, it's got more to do with the with the improving eco economy, uh, economic standards. And this is why I said no, that I Muslim can see that. birth rates are also going down. I yeah, can but Muslims' see that. birth rates are also going down. I yeah, can so see that. that's it's a bad thing. But, but, it's a bad no, thing. No, it but, shows but it exactly is. why development and modernization and human rights is a bad thing. That's my entire point. So, so, so let's so let's stop going to work. Let's stop making money. That's your solution. So we can just stay home and make more no, babies. No, that's it not. Is what... just, it is just. It is just one of this. It is just one of the side effects of that, and humanity will come up with a better solution. If we, if, who knows the, what, what humanity 2.0 might be like? Who knows we might be actually making babies in labs, or maybe we might not even need to uh, may, uh, uh, so, keep increasing like, our humanity you, because we would be living a thousand years longer. So we don't know that. These are the problems that will come even later, and we'll come up with new, newer solutions, and we would have more solutions. If we survive, you can't understand that because you. Yeah, we will survive. Of course, we're not going anywhere. The, 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 the birth rate is still going up everywhere else. No, you just said it's not going up. You said it's going down everywhere. No, no, the glo global, global birth rate is still going up. You just said it's going down. 2060. I said 2060. In my opening statement, I said by 2060, it will, it will start falling down even for Muslims as well. And by 20, by the end of the century, it would hit a critical mass, uh, mass of 10 billion and then we'll start going down. Your stats are all wrong. The birth rates are going no, down. Right. They're going down consistently, even in the Muslim world. The Muslim world, the fertility is going down. It's a bad thing, right? Yeah. And, and by 2060, what you actually cited was that uh, Muslims, I didn't even remember what you cited, but all of the fertility rates are going down consistently across the world. And it's because of yeah. human rights modernization. Islam is saying that family is important. That's why you have to restrict individual autonomy mm. with these kinds of rules I, I mentioned uh, in the mm. Sharia. And that's for the benefit of humanity because you're not going to go extinct. You're not going to so what, have so what should we have? replacement levels fertility. And you can't give so Daniel, me that. what should we have? You can't show me what how human have, rights. Daniel? Sure, yeah, that's what, that's what you should have. No, no, that's no, what but what, what, what's, the ideal, what's the ideal number for the planet we should have? Like 10 billion, 9 billion, 8 billion, maybe 4 billion, reducing the sizes of economy and our footprint. What, what would should, be the better one? We should one? have that... strong, stable families that where a child can no, be you... in a family surrounded by loving family members, his father, his wife, maybe a co-wife, cousins, aunts, oh, uncles, my. all that's a beautiful, stable family, very high fertility. This is the beautiful uh, example of family life that Islam the uh, world. promotes. What the does, what does need, human rights the world promote? Doesn't need to human rights the world. promotes human rights promotes a child with his single mother just going to school and falling into drugs and mental health problems. That's what human rights offers the world. And we see that the with world. the numbers, we see that with all the stats that I gave you, and you have no response to that. I have I've given you a response. Well, I've I've given you more nuanced uh, response, and you're not understanding that because sure these are the 21st century. That would be that would be the latter part of the 21st century problem. Then we'll come up with a solution. What you're saying, you can't Inshallah. give me a Inshallah. reason. Inshallah. What you're we'll saying, come up with you're basing just that. A, one sec, just to hear from Harris. You're you're basing that family life is important because it gives a higher fertility rate. Higher fertility rate means increasing population. When I ask you, what is the ideal population for the planet? You don't know that. You say, well, then you backtrack and then you say, no. How I'm can you know that? that? How can anyone know you the ideal co population of no. the planet? How can well, anyone well, know that? No, no. Human forecasters have actually said that over 10 billion people, the planet would not be able okay, to fine. handle 10 it. 10 billion people. Why. So what? So, 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 okay. So 10 billion. So what happens then after 10 billion? You guys would start, you, if we let you have your way, you'd be like, no, no, no. We want to have the same family system and we want to make 20 babies still. So then we'll go from 10 billion to 15 no, billion. So Islam I can is go not that like way that. As well. If there is a situation no. that requires overall maslaha, oh, okay, are, you a, oh, right. are you aware of this, Harris? Right. Do you have any right. knowledge of I Islam? Am, there is something called I, 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 decision making. If there are pressing global challenges or there are pressing problems, mm. 
the imams and the sharia can accommodate that. It's called maslaha, it's called maqasid the sharia. These are things that are found in Islam. It's a very nuanced uh, yeah. system that you have no appreciation yeah, we, of. That's why you're constantly yeah, straw manning. Look, your future yeah, is well, the future for, for, for of good people reason. watching Netflix at home alone, masturbating and ordering Uber Eats. That's your vision of the future, Harris. And you haven't proposed a single thing consistent you, with human rights that actually co uh, counters that. All right, let's get you a said, you said, you said, uh, you need muslaha. You said that uh, you, 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 your imams can sit down and you really think that we're going to let the future of, uh, of our world in the hands of imams? Um, what, what, what makes you think that we don't have that? We have UN as well. We have uh, the World Health Organization too. We have uh, cl climate organizations too who, who give good advices to scientists on good evidence pretty much on on the evidence that your imams are going to rely on so we have that as well we're also working our solutions we we have problems we, we're working solutions for them immigration comes in and then obviously we know that at some point in china and india their population is going to start declining too after 2060 so that's going to start happening we know that but but again we only look at it from the from the consumerist point of view that for economies to keep growing we need that but the actual absolute critical would be 2.2 what's even if it goes down and then the problem becomes that okay we have an aging population like it's the case in japan so we know these problems exist and that has got more to do with the fact that we have higher living standards people you could blame consumerism more than you want to blame human rights um because human rights is simply that we're talking about is is improving the lives of people and reducing suffering. Unfortunately, you cannot understand that the that the ideas that Prophet Muhammad promoted, those are conducive to the well-being of human, and 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 it, it plays no part in reducing suffering. Maybe as collectively, but that is the same totalitarian ideology that you and, and you dare to call me extremist. I mean, you you say that human rights people are extremists. Yes, right. I mean, the, it, obviously, maybe we right, have right, different meanings of extremism. You're talking about these international organizations, right? And they're planning. Yeah, let's talk about the plans of the World Economic Forum, where they release this position paper that they say by 2030 you will have no privacy, you will own nothing, and you will be happy. Like this is their vision of 2030. Every individual living in a pod and eating some kind of bug-based meats because actual beef is bad for the environment and climate, supposedly. So let's have that vision of it's the not. future. That vision of the future that the World Economic Forum and, and the UN and all these experts, that's the vision that you're promoting, Harris. That's what you want for the future of humanity, this dystopia. And Muslims are just saying, I'm just saying, no, we don't want that future. We don't want a future where all cultures are destroyed, all religions are destroyed. You're just living in a pod by yourself and you have no family, you have no connections. You're just sitting in front of Netflix and masturbating and eating bug-based meats. Muslims are just saying, we don't want that future for humanity, and you're not proposing anything that contradicts that. We want, we want four wives instead, and if, if, some, if my child turns out to be homosexual, he needs to be thrown off the rooftop, and that is what you're uh, proposing, which no, is obviously... very clear. There uh, are with, rules with, that restrict individual liberty and full equality because those are not the that. only values and you can't they're propose not. anything this was the balance question they're, and you haven't proposed they anything you right, haven't, let's, they're not let's, we'll go back you, you to, uh, to harris they're for not, a couple of minutes they're not the acceptable positions by your standards this is i may as well go and live in china then because if i have to take totalitarian views for collective good then i can take some of their totalitarian views as well um you you, you talked about you made fun of like okay you know we're going to be eating bugs or something you know which kind of reminded me of um are snails i mean let's just go back to sharia for a little bit right so do you actually think sharia is sacred do you think it's clear or it's open to interpretation what do, what do you think about sharia like i mean you're defending sharia so, tell, so let's just talk about sharia is it clear or it's open to interpretation there are certain parts of it that are unequivocal uh is the actual term for that and there are certain parts that are open to ijtihad where scholars, uh, ulama, can differ and they can use um, their reasoning based on Quran and Hadith and um, uh, Qiyas as well as Ijma' to come to their conclusions. 
so they are so so for example in the quran we get something like direct 100 to 150 rulings from the quran so everything else comes from uh, from, from hadiths and uh, from traditions that is basically you said some parts are uh, are, are, are absolute and some parts are open to ijma. Well, I would say very few parts are confirmed and absolute. The other ones are open to interpretation, which means it's subjective. So when when we make an argument for objective God or sorry, objective morality, we're, we're basically you're saying you're only giving us some really basic rudimentary level of uh, of of of, um, uh, of rulings that you say that they are absolute. Everything else, I mean. Are you just telling us rape is bad, slavery? Oh, sorry, no, no, slavery is fine in your worldview. Uh, rape is bad, murder is bad, uh, theft is bad. I mean, surely we could. We, no, we there's there's out a lot of different well. directives, uh, as I mentioned. So well, you talked way. about you, you talked about uh, you talked about eating animal uh, e eating bugs. So I mean, I, so that just kind of triggered in my mind. Like, do you think snails are they halal or not? Because Sharia is a lot more complicated than that. Because dietary requirements is considered either is halal or is haram, and Sharia means. Sharia is directly linked to your morality. So you are, if you follow Sharia, you're moral. If you don't, you're immoral. Eating e eating pig would be immoral because it's written in the Quran not to do it. But what about other things like, let's say, snail or a kangaroo? Do you, do you, do you think snail is halal? So it will depend on which school of thought that you're following. Yeah, I mean, exactly. this is not... What are, What is your point? <laughs> my, my point is that it is... It is open to interpretation. I who said that. I acknowledge that. I acknowledge that. Yeah, I, yeah. So, so you're you're trying to put on something to us. Then your system is not really no. That but uh, the from values us that, that I mentioned. Why are why Imams, are you, are you Ijma, talking way more than two minutes, uh, James? Like, what's the balance here? He's just going on and on, rambling. And Go ahead, Daniel. We'll give you several minutes. So I brought I brought family, marriage, romance, love. I didn't get to the points about community, but that's also valuable because people value their way of life. And Islam has brought together all of these different cultures under Islam and they preserved like I'm Persian. Persia was conquered by Arabs, by Arab Muslims and non-Muslim and uh, non-Arabs, too, because the original Muslim community was ethnically diverse. But it was conquered by Islam 1400 years ago. Yet Persia has retained its language. It's retained its culture. It's retained many aspects of its literature. That's because Islam is compatible with people preserving certain aspects, not all, because idol worship, for example, is not preserved. That's not allowed, uh, but preserving certain aspects of um, culture over hundreds of years and I'm living proof of that you have Muslims who are Nigerian who are Malaysian who are Uyghur who are Turkish uh, Desi Arab all of these have maintained their ethnic and cultural traditions but modernization leads to homogeneity the extinction of languages people who have uh, completely been wiped off of the face of the earth cultures that have been wiped off the face of the earth because of colonialism because of this human rights regime that even today you have languages that are going extinct because of colonialism so islam is something that preserves community as well this is an objective value okay you're talking about snails and kangaroos i'm talking about things that are affecting billions of people on this earth right now objectively and you can't address any of those points how are you going to preserve community okay islam has certain kinds of rules and regulations that preserve community as part of the sharia but what do, do you have to offer what does human rights offer you haven't addressed well, that and you haven't also I, I addressed have... the fact that you're you're blaming you saying that people in afghanistan are running to the airport and you're blaming the taliban you're blaming sharia because of that but when you have uh, people in el salvador and latin america who are literally uh, risking their lives the lives of their children to migrate to the united states from these human rights hellholes you don't blame that on human rights you don't blame that on lgbt rights and women's rights that are respected and practiced throughout latin america why harris are they risking their lives to migrate to the U.S. That's another question, the Botswana, Botswana question that you haven't really addressed. Well, I, answered, I answered that before as well, that this is probably because one, one is because of the economic uh, reasons and oh, the really? other one is for human rights violation yeah. reasons. Why? Yeah, so of course, you know? no shit. What, Why? Well, Go ahead, no, Harris. No, because I want to give Harris a couple minutes did, too. Sure. Uh, weren't you the one who was quoting the GDPs of El Salvador and Botswana and United States? So of course, it's because of... 
So, so why, why everything has to be so binary? With so you no guys? one in Afghanistan Maybe cares about economics. We want to give you a couple you minutes to hear this as well. Yes, let's just go with that, Akikachu. You made multiple points and then you let me finish because there was another point as well before that. So this is very simple. Uh, economic reasons, people, this actually shows us our longing for better lifestyle. Um, and we would want to go to America. We would want to go to Europe. We would want to go to Australia, a better country, so we can improve our lives. We can buy bigger houses. We can give. We can have less children, not four times two, meaning eight, not that many. We can give them good quality education, good food, good clothes, everything. This is human nature. We, are, we, are, we long for it, and that's the reason why we have. Yes, there might be consequence of falling birth rate. The same generation, same people from same community, when they go to Western countries, even they start having less kids as well. So, um, so, so that is a... That is a side effect of it, but that's just the way it is. But you think that what you replace it with, either take it all or you don't, then sorry, we can't take that because Sharia doesn't just come with that. It does come. You, you, you laugh at, at, at kangaroos and snails, but, you know, there are so many other baggages that come with that too, such as homosexuals, the honor culture, wife beating, multiple wives, and, and, and not to mention really bad sense of fashion. Everything comes with it. Um, so... Uh, so those are, those are the things. What, what, what did you ask earlier about? Um, you, you said something else earlier about uh, before this Botswana problem. About community. You were asking me another question. Yeah. How does this human yeah, well, rights regime preserve community, preserve family, preserve marriage? These objective values. Are these objectives? Do you think marriage is valuable? Well, as I said, the only reason is that we look at for the next yes generation. Yes or no? Is it valuable or not? We, we, we look at, we, no, it's more complicated than that because we look so at, you, we it's look possible at that marriage how is the not next valuable. generation. Marriage and well, romance marriage and love? No, no, romance and love might be, but not marriage because, you know, mar marriage doesn't mean much. I mean, you, you can you can be a partner, you can be in a, in a civil agreement with someone and but you can even live those are without declining. marriage for 10 years. Those are declining. No, they're too. not. Well, they are. No, I cited, really. cited I mean, all of the stats. I don't, I don't trust you. That, sorry, we will have to. You're we'll having have to look people who it. are having not, permanently celibate, not having sex. No, you're talking One about out of four people, like. according to Pew, according to the stats I mentioned. Okay. Is sex we'll, valuable? We'll, we'll have a, is sex valuable? We'll, we'll, yes or no? Or is we'll it look, complicated? We'll, everything is complicated, we'll, right, Harris? We'll, no. Well, yeah, is because not everything is binary, not? though. Not not everything is binary. Yes, sex is sex is very valuable, and okay, uh, then sex it's declining. It's declining under human rights. Human no, rights, all these of, nations not, are, people are becoming celibate not because of human rights. against their will. Not because of human rights. Yes. Not because then, of human rights, but because of economic, e e economic standards. I mean, we, we are becoming consumerism. You could talk about capitalism again. This is why I said, this is why I said it's complicated because there's so many things. It's not binary. You don't, you say that, okay, if we just bring Sharia and Islamic values, all of a sudden people will be locked up inside houses and they'll be making babies and everything will be hunky-dory. No, yeah, that Muslims is not Muslims actually like sex. Solution. Muslims like well, sex. We like to reproduce. Alhamdulillah. We, we're men, yeah, right. right? We're not, we're yeah, actual yeah. men. We're not these kinds of soy right. boys. Soy boy right, okay. liberal human rights advocates. We're men. Right. Okay. We, we like to well, stay at our houses and have sex, actually, in marriages. Well, 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 well done. Well done. And, yeah, and, uh, and, and I see... And, and, and I see how you say that, what kind of men you are. You actually say that, oh, you know, don't you want a, a woman who is obedient? That is your definition of manhood. Because we like this stable marriages. Like 99% yeah, because you of like other keep... human cultures. Like 99% like yeah, of well, other human cultures that you want to wipe out. Primitive. That you want primitive to wipe cultures. out. Yeah, you, yeah, yeah, wipe primitive, out the primitive, primitive people. Bomb them. No, I'm not saying for wipe out. I'm not saying wipe no, yeah, no people. Those primitive people. No, I said cultures. Them. cultures. Genocide those primitive people. Good job, Harris. Cultures. You're an amazing human rights advocate. It's not going to work. Primitive people. Haki, Haki, it's not going to work. I'm talking about the this, cultures being primitive. And when those people yeah, those come out, cultures, when they step out. into the top, when they, when, yes, so that's fine. Cultures, I don't care about that. But when they come out in the 21st century, they adopt modernism. When they come to the modern world, then that's good. Then everyone, whether they're from Botswana or they're from uh, El Salvador or from India or China or Pakistan, wherever they go, Afghanistan, they go to America, they, or their own local countries become, become modern. That's fine, because then we're not going to expect 50% of our population to be obedient to us. Now, that's your definition of manhood. I'm sorry. Yeah, that's you want everyone to be manhood. obedient and my to manhood the totalitarian is still intact. state. You want everyone to be obedient to the te totalitarian technocratic state. You want all power monopolized by the central authority who can shove you in your pod and issue you social credits with constant surveillance. The, con the system that we see in China and that's being rolled out in the EU 
in Europe and now being considered in Canada and North America. This totalitarian system, that's what you want. That's consistent with human rights. That's what human rights ultimately leads to, right? So those primitive cultures, primitive Muslims, primitive Aboriginals, Native Americans, we need to wipe out their cultures and uh, they need to adopt this universal homogeneic get in your pod, eat the bug meat, eat your soy, forget about sex because it's not valuable or family is not valuable. Yeah, that's the future that you're envisioning, Harris. It's not attractive didn't, to didn't me. You guys, it's not attractive to me. Didn't you guys? I don't know don't about you guys your Hindu that... or Christian followers, but uh, don't you, I think they're don't... starting to realize that what you're offering is this con, this hoax, and it's really, I know, I can see. really scary, actually. This is the terror of the modern liberal state it's devolving can, it's destroying the human race okay i i, I can i can see how my hindus and christian followers are like turning they're, they're saying the shahada and they're converting to islam very quickly so you know you need to inshallah, look up the meaning inshallah. of that dream will never come true daniel because people are leaving islam not joining islam the only power the only way you can keep islam going is as you said be a man keep making yeah. babies but uh, you, need, you need to look up you I'm need honest. no you're not no, you're not. Um, uh, you need to look up. You need to look up the meaning of totalitarian. I mean, you have totally. What's the, what's I'm, the meaning? I'm actually what's the definition? I'm actually. Of I'm actually. I'm, actually, I'm, actually, I'm, I'm actually surprised. Me, no, no, Harris. hang on a sec. I'm actually. I'm actually surprised. I'm actually surprised that you actually didn't use in defense of slavery. You didn't use the exam. Um, the the example of well, modern day nine to five job is slavery as well. Um, you, you didn't use that because you know that's how you come up with that these kind of argument is too sophisticated analogies. for you, Harris. You can't yeah, even right. understand no, the basic you can, argument. You know he was so pathetic. You, you couldn't knew even so understand. Pathetic. I can't educate you on all these things, Harris. You knew, Respond you to knew, the argument you knew, that I gave, not another you, debate. You knew, Stop riding you knew, Ape uh, Apus's coattails. Just respond to the argument you that knew, I gave. You knew, you knew it was so pathetic that you actually dropped that. You were so scared to actually no. use that. No. Um, yes, well, you were. Scary, um, I'm, I'm so the, scared. I'm terrified of you, Harris. You're, you're a towering I, intellect. I can see. I can I I can see Here, that. Let's, I, let me I can have see some questions about now, that. So, Harris. so so I I no you haven't even let me. Okay, uh, go, all right. Go ask, ask more questions because no because I actually forget, I actually forget because you go in so many different tangents that I actually forget about what you what okay, you were so, asking me. And Harris, you start having a ramble. You're an admirer of Richard Dawkins. You've called him your hero. You think he's this towering intellectual figure. He's actually praised your book. You've praised him, but he tweeted back in 2013 this tweet. All the world's Muslims have fewer Nobel Prizes than Trinity College, Cambridge. Okay, So what is this genius implying here? He's implying that Islam is so backwards and so uneducated that they have so few Nobel Prizes. So, Harris, explain to me, how many Nobel Prizes does Latin America have? How many Nobel Prizes does China and Sub-Saharan Africa have? How many Nobel Prizes does India have? And, and what's the discrepancy between the Nobel Prizes Colonialism. in the UK? Colonialism, I, right? Look, I, so yeah, then tell, yes. tell Dawkins. I, 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 no, I, I get it. The, 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 those countries are colonials. But the other <laughs> point is that, that you – no, but we – If it's the colonialism, then educate the Dawkins. Age of Islam. Educate Dawkins because yeah, he's blaming it, Islam. No, but it, you need to tell him that, even, no, this is because of colonialism. Even, even before – even before Nobel Prizes became a thing, even before that, when there was no colonialism, when Islamic Caliphate was in full flow, it did not match the, the levels of scientific revolution that West enjoyed or even the Islamic world enjoyed in the 10th and 9th and 10th centuries. And there was a whole scholarly work behind that, different opinions on that. Some people blame Genghis Khan, some people blame Al-Ghazali, whatever the reason was. But science or discovery in the Islamic world just went down. Um, and unfortunately, it seems like, for example, when we just simply talk about evolution, we talk about evolution and, and when the Muslim scholarly, when Islamic when universities in Muslim countries, when they don't even acknowledge evolution, how are we ever going to make any progress in the fields of biology? Uh, you could argue about physics and chemistry. And we could hope Let's, that, but again, another, this would be linked. Like, this would be, this, wait, 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 let me finish my point, man, come on. Very, this this would come to a point that as Muslim countries advance as well, they get better. We get better e economy in countries like Pakistan or Turkey or Saudi Arabia is modernizing. Now the Saudi Arabia is modernizing. We're getting better university. UAE is modernizing, better universities. Then yes, UAE has put a problem. I'm happy for UAE. 
but that has also just come from modernism not necessarily not not by reading the quran or bringing sharia back i mean people just, muslim countries are talking sharia as well but you conceded that islam had a golden age of science right so it's not islam that's the problem it's colonialism that's islamic the world Islamic world had it. Islamic world had it. Not Islam causes. It's like West Ham and Christian world have. <laughs> so have, all the problems. Yeah, well, all the problems are blamed on Islam, and all of the positive things are blamed on everything except Islam. That's the way that you're going about it, right? Well, what, How's, what, where's what the directly principle? comes from? What what directly comes from theology? It would be blamed on that. I mean, the, this no, the theology is very the clear. Allah says slavery, to, sex, slavery. These come by feeding. These kind of things come directly from Islam. To. Yes, yeah, all responded good to. people. I responded to all of people. those points. You, you have you didn't well, 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 you saying people, that yeah, people, people you're saying judge. you acknowledge that Islam is not anti-science. Want to jump in? Just pardon my interruption, but do want to mention we're going to go in just a short bit. We're going to go into the Q and A, folks, and at the live chat at Modern Day Debate. If you type in at Modern Day Debate, that helps it make it clearer for me to see your question. We do have a lot though in terms of the Q and A questions already, so no guarantees that we'll get to it because we want to get our speakers out at a decent time. But go ahead, gentlemen. Want to give you a chance to wrap up I think the I'll, last I discussion. Think we'll, I think we should go to the questions as well, because I think we've only got 10, 15 minutes left. Um, uh, but anyway, I kind of enjoyed this conversation. I think there's, there's probably a lot more to talk about. And um, uh, Hakikaju should, we, we, I don't know if you want, maybe we can have a, a round two as well. But um, where, where you think that you have given answers to slavery or uh, wife beating or whatever these things, where you think in your mind, and this is what fascinates me, that you live in such a little bubble of your manhood, that you think that whatever you've said People are going to buy that. No one is buying that other than your own choir boys. No, no one outside of that circle is buying that. This doesn't make any sense, Daniel. If you just they are buying just it because a bit. they're part of those cultures too. The Christians and the Hindus and the Jews. They can look Mama. at their own cultures. They can look at their own traditions. They can look at their ways of life, and they'll find that there are a lot of traditions are bad. A lot of parallels with Islam, and then they'll realize that wow, it's the modern world that's destroying Slavery. our ways of life. It's modern mm -hmm. world that's destroying our families, our marriages, and clearly this is not sustainable. That's what they're going to realize. You just saying slavery, wife beating, concubines. That's all you. Your whole argument is just putting out those words. You haven't addressed because, or been because conversant. Because it matters. Because you haven't been conversant with any of the arguments or the points that I made, logically explaining, citing academics, citing riffraff. You haven't. Yeah, it's riff all riffraff. Riff Academia is riffraff. Riff I try to be objective. Your, 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 nah, it's not objective. You didn't even, you didn't even answer my objective okay, morality question. Scientific studies are scientific, scientific studies are objective. Well, I don't. I'm not going to take scientific any scientific studies? study from you. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna. It's take not from me. It's published in Science. It's well, published in I, Nature. Pew is Pew. You have a problem with Pew? And your. How about the Global Social Survey? How about that? How about the Ethnographic your, Atlas? How about that? How about your interpretations? World Values Survey. Are those your, objective? I'm not gonna. I'm not, I'm not going to take your interpretations of them. I'm not going to take your interpretations I just gave you the of numbers. them. And also, I don't trust. Well, well, no, you just gave me. I'm not aware of them. I, I no, can't. I'll, if I I'll can't verify all them, of I'm the not going to comment I'll put well, that's all the good. And then maybe we can have a round. video description Ooh. after the debate, yeah, yeah, yeah. so people can analyze right. it for themselves. And then, yeah, yeah. What we what we can do is you can actually send. So when you put it up, then we can debate on them, and then we we'll see that how honest is your interpretation of those of that data, and how you're actually turning, how you're twisting your worldview to fit that as a solution. And then I'll see. Okay, how can I? shift my worldview and uh, and fit according to that and then get come up with a solution so you know this is it's actually very easy i think daniel you you, you should know this um, um but anyway so so the reason why i bring up those loaded terms is because i know this is your achilles heel if you were if you, for us it's harder to uh, to argue or reason with people uh, who, who are these postmodernist Islamic scholars? Because they also believe in this, you know, constantly evolving morality, and and they believe in they're reasonable people because they haven't switched off the compassion switch. But you guys, it's so easy because yes, I just have to throw sex slave at you. Like your prophet did that. Why would I want morality or, or family system from him when he did that? I, I'm sorry. I'll, I'll, I'll find someone else. I'll use my own brain to come up with another solution. So anyway, I think we should open up um, to... So your um, problem questions. is not with Islam. Your problem is not with the Prophet, peace be upon him, practice sex slavery. You find this throughout all of these 99% of other societies and cultures. Read yeah. Lawrence Keeley, his book on pre-modern war warfare. Read all of that and see... No, like they're all ancient. Saying. I know that. They're all ancient. I know that. I, I, I don't, I don't yeah, know. So that. shouldn't morality base, be based on contextual factors? Morality should be based on reason 
in light of constantly evolving situations okay, around yeah, us. Exactly. There are the different situations and circumstances in the past than today. Look, no, but that's what you claim. That's not your claim, though, Tyus. These morality, no, this morality is for all time. You change your position, no, Akika. You were supposed that. to be literalist and honest. Didn't this I say that? Didn't I say that jihad? Supposed to be for all didn't time. I say jihad? Didn't I say slavery? I said that certain aspects of now. Islamic law, certain aspects of Islamic law, are context dependent. They're based on ijtihad. They're based on maslaha maqasid, and certain are not. This is something that is acknowledged in. Throughout Islamic tradition in fiqh and Sharia jurisprudence, it's all there. There's I haven't, um, you know, certain rulings are always anything there. or hidden certain everything rulings, in an open book. Certain about this. rulings, certain rulings are, have always been there. Certain yeah. rulings will always stay there, and those yeah. rulings Others are barbaric. Not. Yeah, but those rulings are barbaric, and and, and uh, no, no. I mean, because you, you this is what Baghdadi you said. You, you Baghdadi it. said. Baghdadi said, why should I stop making taking slaves? Because UNO or America tells me, which is a very valid point. Your prophet allowed you to have sex slaves. So I what, gave you the re reasoning so for should, that. You gave the reason for other imams. I don't accept that. What if, what if I'm a literalist? What if I follow just a hadith? I gave you an argument. Remember I prophet? said, uh, let I'm me sorry. steel man your argument, Harris. Okay, people who are watching, rewind the tape and watch that section. I steel manned your argument for you. You didn't even make that point. I made that point. And I explained why, why even in that again? situation, even in that situation, the world would be a better place if instead of nukes, chemical warfare, biological warfare, constant mass surveillance from intelligence agencies and uh, warrantless wiretapping, all of this on one hand and a world that has no, slavery and a world that's that has slavery. No, Which one is better? No, and I said, and there's a lot that, to say about slavery being the better world, the, the world that's lower that's tech, but has slavery. Not for the slave. No, not really. Not yeah, for the slave. It's not, I mean, it's slave not great probably, for the guy who's would probably... being nuked. It's not great no, for the guy we, that's no, being not... burned alive with chemical weapons, with biological weapons. It's not that's, great for those victims arguable. of Agent Orange, that's those arguable. children born with these kinds of huge I would rather be nuked. I would rather be, I would rather be nuked than either. be a slave for someone for 20 years. I would rather be nuked than be enslaved for someone for 30 years. Than be but killed by a nuclear weapon. We must yeah, I'd rather be killed than be a slave. Then be a slave, yes. That's really logical. That's so easy. So, That's gentlemen, logical, I do you want to transition. I do know that there are more points to be made. However, you may get to make them as we do have a lot of questions. So we're going to fire through these really fast. And I also want to encourage you, each of you, I'm okay with it sometimes where either of you will give a response to the other person. But I want to ask because we have so many questions and I really do want to get through them all for the audience as they've already put those questions in, is if you could try to do as few responses as possible. And I know it's going to be tempting because you're going to want to respond to as many, like probably all of the things that your opponent says, but that basically doubles the time of the Q&A rather than if we just have one person and, and you could say kind of let the audience try to kind of pin them to the wall. And so once in a while, I'm okay with it, but I do want to keep it down to a minimum so we can get through people's questions. So jumping in and want to remind you folks, our guests are linked in the description. So both Daniel and Harris are linked in the description down below in YouTube and at the podcast as all of our debates end up on podcasts within 24 hours of them being live. Mr. Monster with the first question says, truly Islam does not allow for free will. Daniel, I think that's for you. Wait, wait, can you repeat that? Sorry. They said, clearly Islam does not allow for free will. No, the argument that I made is that individual liberty and the freedom to choose and equality, these are beautiful values that Islam acknowledges and respects. But Islam says that these are not the only values. There are other values that are important as well and deserve to be respected and preserved. There are other institutions that deserve to be respected and preserved. Uh, institutions like marriage, family, community, and just human biology, humanity itself. That is something that is worth preserving but in order to preserve those things sometimes you have to put limits on free choice on individual liberty and this is why islam is balanced but if you have this human rights extremism where free choice and free will is everything then that leads to really bad consequences and the stats the objective stats prove how that ideology is destroying marriage it's destroying family it's destroying community it's destroying all these other values the value of truth for example 
Truth is an important value. Justice is an important value. But if happiness and free will are the only uh, values, why not just put everyone on soma, like on these kinds of antidepressants that make put people in a constant state of euphoria? Why not have that kind of future using technology? Because then you'll maximize happiness. And is that going to be the best world that we would live in, where everyone is doped up on soma, like in the novel Brave New World? Is that the future that we want? No, we because happiness is not the only value. We got it in. We must jump to the next one. Thank you very much for your question. This one coming in yeah, from so you to have I can't answer that. Well, I mean, if you like, it's going to double up the time of the Q and A if we have okay. each of you respond how, to a how question. How much time do we have? How, how much time do we have? We, well, let's see. If you include the fact that we cut early on a couple sections, have maybe about thirty. I would say, about thirty-eight minutes for the Q and A. So we've got to like cruise through these. And I got to say, folks. Please, we, we have so many questions that at this point, we can't guarantee that we'll get to read any new questions. So please know that no matter what way you submit the question, we have so many. I want to let you know there's no guarantee we can read it. So I, I, highly... I But I, I, I have to respond to this one because I think it's fair to have the other response as well. Uh, because Whoa, hold on a me, second. So, so hold on not... one second. It, just so you're... Do you understand, though, the idea that it will... Yeah. Like the audience has submitted a lot of questions they'd love to have heard. And so if we have... You've already had about two hours of you guys going back and forth. And so... Okay. I do kind of want to minimize these. If you really have to on this one, on whether or not- No, no, that's together. okay. Okay, okay, okay. Let's go with the next one then. You'd have, heck you says, under Sharia, Muhammad was allowed to marry Aisha, Aisha when she was six. Would this be allowed under your system, Daniel? Oh, so two questions for me. We're not going to go back and forth? Oh, some of them, a lot of them are going to be- it, there's yeah we haven't like organized it so that it's alternating it's sometimes it's going to be several in a just row for one it, person Daniel. just answer it yeah i mean uh, this is something that many cultures practice to this day and it's again it's based on this biological reality and you find uh, many cultures where they're trying to maximize the fertility window of women because they want to have more children and this is basically the way that sci evolutionary psychologists explain it and I, i'm not promoting evolution but this is these are people that you would respect harris or other atheists they say that it's actually to an evolutionary advantage to maximize the fertility window so you have as many children as possible because women only have about 25 to 30 years of fertility if they wait until they're 25 or 30 or 35 to get married and have kids or have sex then that means they'll only have maybe one maximum two children but this will allow extinction of the population and for the people to be wiped out so this goes back to what Lawrence Keeley says and this is why you find it uh, in so many societies uh, in the pre-modern period and even today because it's biologically hardwired and you have a discussion actually about whether marrying uh, children who are, who are pubescent okay so around 10 years old nine years old this is something that there's a dispute and a debate within psychology whether this is a psychological disorder and your secular atheist psychologists say that no it can't be considered a dysfunction because it is practiced in these societies it's evolutionarily adaptive so it's not actually causing any harm and when we look at the girls and the women in these societies there's nothing that is dysfunctional about them and uh, problematic. What's interesting is that that is not considered marriage to uh, nine-year-olds is not considered pedophilia. What is pedophilia are the practices of modern pedophiles who go into the closet and diddle little kids. That's ab abhorrent. That is an ab abomination. Islam does not promote that. Islam promotes marriage. It promotes family. It promotes these wholesome values. And other societies have practiced this as well. I mean, Richard Dawkins actually is on record speaking in multiple interviews where he actually Ooh, defends so mild pedophilia. Let's move on to the next yeah. one. I hate to do that, well, but I, I, so many. I, I, we have a ton of questions, you guys. And so, I mean, I if, have to respond to this. I have, okay, I have, I mean, that's I have, fewer questions from the audience that get sorry, answered. That's fine. That, I'm, I'm really sorry, guys, but, but, but these are really critical ones. So, first of all, you said Islam doesn't allow, you know, the Western way, you know, like how there's pedophilia, etc. Yeah, Islam just legalizes pedophilia. Uh, Aisha, one could actually argue, she actually didn't even have kids. So, maybe she was damaged internally because she was married at the age of nine. Um, uh, 
Hakika to everything. This is what happens when you become so dogmatic about one particular idea. Now, to, in this debate, it seems like he's overly concerned about the fertility rate. And he's talking about, okay, fertility rate. So we have to maximize the fertility rate. Yes, from the moment a little girl has her first period, that's it. Let her have turn her into a baby-making uh, machine, as though this is her only purpose in life, to just make babies. You could... Um, uh, Okay, you could argue that um, a women fertility window narrows down from 20 age of ages of 22, 23, maybe 25 to 35. Okay, so how many babies you want you want to make out of it? 20 babies that you need 20 years or something? One or two or three, even three babies is well within. It's very possible. Yes, again, there are consumerism issues, but the solution that Daniel Hakikachu offers are beyond disgusting. Uh, this I'll give you a chance uh, to respond, Daniel, how, and then we've got to go to the next one. Uh, Short well, then I would need then I would need time to respond. This can he had his go. The question was originally for him, so we usually give the person who the question was addressed to the last word on it. Otherwise, it's kind of like the audience is ganging up on them, and then you're ganging up on them as well after they respond. Yeah, I, I don't think what yeah. Harris said. Like, yeah, obviously this is something that's not practiced today. Oh, um, you have different values. I gave you the justification. I gave you the reasoning. I showed you that this is something that is practiced uh, pretty widely. In the world and even many cultures today they they practice it women actually naturally want to have children women and men right. want to reproduce this is a natural biological function and people have been doing it for all of human history it's only human rights extremism that is destroying these cultures and these traditions and these practices so i don't know what else i can say i gave you the logical basis of it and there's really nothing to say you're again your idol your hero dawkins he defends mild pedophilia he says that he doesn't i can't one, find we it must, we're not, he right, we have to we this we're, that's bringing up he doesn't. Outside the he doesn't. question so i do want to go to this next one james called zero says, hierarchy. says that <clears throat> okay so this is a a two-parter they said all Dan needs to do is convince us that slavery being legal is better than slavery being illegal, that people should be killed for leaving Islam, that non-Muslims should have lower legal rights, that marital rape should be legal, that intercourse with nine-year-olds should be legal, should be easy. We'll give you a chance to respond to that. What's the question? Some of these are just comments or you could say objections. I don't understand what's the objection. It sounded like a long list. With that, there it should be. Well, we'll go to the next one then. The super. I, I responded super. to all every single one of those points: slavery, sex. You slavery. think in your mind you, you, you think in your mind you've given you good justification, but you actually have to go to the next one. The super destroyer says, People "What book trouble. on Islamic? You've talked for two hours. We must go to the next one. What book on Islamic jurisprudence has Harris read? It seems he got his education of Islamic law from watching Fox News." <laughs> well, well, um, no, I've uh, I've read. Uh, uh, all the Sahai Sitta books. I've uh, read the Quran. I've, uh, I've, I've read. I've read. Uh, yeah, I know. I'm coming to that. Um, uh, I haven't read the actual books of Fiqh, well, but uh, I've read some pamphlets here and there. I've read. I've read some pamphlets here and there, which is uh, that. That's fine. I'm. I'm only turned off. I'm only turned off when I read the Quran. When I talk, when I look at amputations as a solution for uh, to save the world from from theft or uh, to to um, to keep the society going and to keep the war economy going, we need to own slaves. I'm sorry, I've got better things to do. I'd read a book on evolution or um, or how the universe came came about. I'd rather study that. But um, um, but yeah, the, the, I've, I've read I've read some objections. I've written I've looked into it. But uh, I'm sorry, it's not very impressive. This one coming in from, do appreciate your question. Apostate Prophet says, should Islam be enforced upon the disbelievers? Yeah, Islam, wait, you said Apostate Prophet, Apos? That's, it's Apostate Prophet. Uh, okay, Apos. I don't Apos, know what the other word means, but. Uh, Apos, we discussed this in our debate. Go and rewatch the tape. I, we talked about universalism. Liberalism is a universalist ideology. It believes in imposing human rights and this kind of LGBT rights uh, extremism on the entire planet. And it does through that through colonialism, through occupation, through sanctions, forced famine. That is the universalism of liberalism and human rights being imposed on the entire globe. Islam is also universalist. It also believes that Islam should spread. And I've talked about this in our debate. People can go back and watch that, which you acknowledge you lost that. So, you know, yeah, Islam is universalist. So what? All of these other 
idea, uh, belief systems, including human rights liberalism, are universalist as well. And they employ coercion in the same way that Islam has coercion, but Islam is the, the truth. Let's go to the next one. Wolf says to both speakers, what are your thoughts on the new government the Taliban is attempting to set up in Afghanistan? We can start with you, Harris, if you uh, want to go. We haven't heard from you. Well, this is uh, obviously atrocious, and all the people who are leaving uh, Afghanistan in such numbers, and Pakistan is over flooded with refugees from Afghanistan, from the very same Afghans who think that Pakistan helped install uh, Taliban into Afghanistan. They're going to, they, they, they don't like Pakistan, but they're still going to Pakistan because they think it is far better than what Afghanistan is going to be. So uh, I think they, the huge number of people, and, and the people who have stayed behind are the only ones who are not resourceful enough. Um, we, we saw when Taliban took over K uh, Kabul, we saw how um, every road, ev every traffic jam was leading, leading to the airport. So um, that alone says it all. All of a sudden, these women, these people, women who are buying burqas, they have realized, oh, hang on, maybe I should wear a burqa. No, it's not. It's purely out of fear and intimidation that um, because you talk so much about. And then he says that, oh, you, the world is imposing human rights on us. Yes, they're both universalist, universalist, if you want to, if you want to say. But one is saying, you know, have some compassion, mm -hmm. and the other one is saying, no, we're going to chop your hands, we're going to throw Most people on rooftops, we're going to stone adulterers to death. So Daniel, this, what are your well, the world is apart. Daniel, what are your thoughts? Yeah, the Taliban, um, they're another government. Insofar as they want to implement Sharia, I think that's great. I really hope that they will implement the Sharia. And I hope, you know, that they will not be attacked and sanctioned and pressured by oh. the U.S. Uh, and in these brutal kinds of ways where other countries, all countries that try to implement Islam are... Uh, sanctioned and pressured but I have a question for uh, related to this because uh, Harris mentioned people leaving Afghanistan uh, to Harris. I highly recommend we don't do it just because we have so many questions from the audience that they really want to hear you guys respond to if if look Harris if you're you were offered you make imagine 50k in the Australia if there were a country that was offering you 10 times as much right 10 times as much 500k would you get on the next flight to that country? No, pro no, probably not. No, 500k, 10 no. times your salary, 50 no. times your salary. No, no, the, the, <laughs> no because uh, because if I have my yeah, because if I have my family here, I'm happy here. I'm actually you can yeah, I'm, move I'm your actually, family first class with that kind of no, paycheck. Um, yeah, but maybe maybe I still have yeah, okay, maybe if you make the whole family as well, <laughs> then then maybe the case. But okay, well, why are you so laughing? Why? Is there, as a, hang on, well, 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 you, I, I, I gotta finish this point. Why are you laughing as though you've actually made a slam dunk argument? You haven't proven anything. So you've actually put the you put the you've actually proven my point. It's a massive own goal, Daniel, because these people who are trying to go to America, they're single males. They're only sometimes there's only women have been giving their children away, just take my child away. So they're not like going entire family for economic reasons. Yes, if it was for economic reasons, you could say, okay, it's for economic reasons, but these people are not leaving for economic reasons. These people are leaving out of fear for Taliban and the suffering they're going to bring to people. Now you can Let's go to the next one. This one coming in from Apostate Prophet says, Daniel, Muhammad said the sun travels. Wait, wait, to why are we taking all questions from apostate prophet? He already got his questions. Go to some other question. I don't need. I don't need to answer questions from that loser. Like he's not relevant. We we, we answer them in the order they came in. Be so careful, like Pikachu, because after this debate, where, where, where are the questions from Where Harris? Where are the questions from from Muslims go to the for Harris? Listen, I we're listen. We take them in the order that they come in. If you want to. Make sure yeah, that it's I want done that particular way. You have to let us. You have to let us. This is the way Harris we've always done it. Asked. Nobody's ever complained about it in 600 <laughs> debates that I've moderated. So we're going to do this complains. the way that we've always done You're it. This one comes like, in. They say not enough questions, but this they said, is from the same person. They said, "Listen, we take them in the order that they came in. If you didn't want that, you could you could let us know before the debate." So they said, "Muhammad said the sun travels to a resting place at sunset and prostrates to the throne of Allah, where it asks for permission to rise again." Do you agree with Muhammad? Uh, the Quran yeah. says this, the Hadith say this, and yes, of course, I agree. And this is not related to the debate. This is something that's irrelevant to the question of Sharia and human rights. If you want to talk about uh, Islam and science and interpretation of the Quran and ha conflicts with modern science, I'm happy to do that and talk with a reasonable person about this topic. But this is not relevant to the debate. I, I don't understand the moderation here, James, because you're supposed to ask relevant questions about the debate. This is something completely irrelevant. 
This one coming in from That's Secular Pagan Mums. Thanks for your super sticker. And Grimlock says, I'm sad that I can't skip ahead in the debates. Apostate Prophet says, you guessed it. Here he is again. Come Daniel, on. the Quran says that the stars are missiles thrown. Let's see. I, I do. I saw <laughs> relevant. Relevant. Look, he's, he's on. Daniel, is... can I even, is it okay if I finish? Where do you think it's okay to just interrupt people? So my point, I was actually going to agree with you, Daniel. I was going to say, like, it is true that these aren't really related to the, to the actual debate. So that is something that I want to be mindful of. Lindsay Marie says, Daniel, you really believe all Muslims don't have sex before marriage and don't sleep around on the partners? Yeah, the stats show that. Muslims, read Stephen Fish, are Muslims um, unique? Read his book, read um, the articles that I'll cite for you that show that uh, Muslims have lower levels of premarital sex, lower levels of extramarital sex. This is something that is a sociological fact that non-Muslim academics have written about. You can look at the also the World Value Survey from Engelhart, and he also establishes the lower rate of premarital sex and support for premarital sex amongst Muslims. Now, some, a minority of Muslims are obviously having premarital and extramarital sex. The point is that it's at a much lower overall level than um, these other religions and these other modernized uh, people. This one coming in from, you guessed it, apostate prophet says, Daniel, do you prefer Islamic law or secularism? If you had the power, would you eat would you want to return the u.s into an islamic country what would happen to the resistant disbelieving men and women in this islamic america so there is a lot of ways to spread islam right and we invite i invite non-muslims in america and throughout the world to look into islam investigate islam look at these arguments that i'm, I'm making and have an open mind like you see this kind of con game and hoax that people like Harris and Apus are doing where they're trying to you know repeat the same talking points but it's all based on lies and when you actually understand how Islam and Sharia law orthodox strict Sharia law is promoting family and marriage and community and re results in flourishing of human life all people and how this has been the case for 1400 years then people will be open and will want to accept Islam. This is what I this is my message to non-Muslims watching and I do it with a very sincere and open heart. This one coming in from Death Hip says Daniel colonialism is soaked by non-Europeans as well, mostly by Asians, Chinese and Japanese, etc., and even sub-Saharan Africa like Ida Amin. Ida Amin. Thank you. Yeah, I agree. Like that that's proving my point. You have conquering people conquering and being conquered throughout human history. This is why war and slavery and sex slavery are so ubiquitous throughout human history across all these cultures. But there is no colonialism like modern European colonialism because modern European colonialism has technology and it is that enables more genocide. Now, of course, there were genocides in the past, ethnic genocides that happened, but Islamic conquest is not genocidal and it's not ethnic based because people can convert into Islam. Con uh, conquered people like the Persians, like my ancestors, they converted into Islam and they achieved equal status with the conquering Muslim community. So this is very unique in Islam. This is why Islam has been so ethnically and culturally rich and diverse, but you don't find this with European co colonialism because it wipes people out. We have so many people, Native Americans, Aboriginals, um, Asians that have gone completely extinct because of European uh, human rights colonialism. So basically, one, your, your ancestors this one coming in. gave I hate up. To do this. I hate to do this, but just because we have so many. Cold Loyalty says, Daniel, are you not aware that Islamic groups pushing Sharia law are currently committing vicious murders of families and children and posting them on the Internet? What about those destroyed families? No, I don't um, condone any kind of barbarism. There are many terrorist groups. Many of these terrorist groups are actually... Uh, agents of different intelligence agencies and they deliberately commit atrocities and post it online to make Islam look bad, to make Sharia look bad. These are just, um, you know, 
counterintelligence operations, the same kind of operations that have been used for many groups by modern intelligence agencies from the West and from Israel. So I condemn uh, these kinds of terroristic actions, and I don't endorse them at all. I've never endorsed them. You got this poor one. Islam. They don't let us have sex slaves. Sorry. This one we must we must go to this next one. I'll give you a chance to respond if you want, Daniel, because I want you to have the last word since it was addressed addressed to you. If you want to give oh, the last oh, word to that what one. he just said. Yeah. He just he's just saying words. What is there to respond to? You got it. Well, you don't have to. That's all right. Can't respond. <laughs> this one coming in from apostate prophet says the Quran describes disbelievers, including Jews and Christians, as quote unquote worst of creatures and quote-unquote less than cattle, does Daniel agree this fits with the Sharia law? Well, Islam uh, is universalist, as I mentioned, and it says that belief in God and accepting of God's messengers is an important part of being a good and moral person and rejecting God and rejecting his signs, rejecting his message to humanity, the Creator's message to humanity, uh, this is a, a very immoral thing to do. In fact, it's one of the most immoral things to do. Associating partners with God, creating idols to worship in place of God. These are some of the worst things, the most immoral things to be done. And so this is the moral vision that Islam offers. And there is a lot to say about that. There's actually a video that I'm going to publish in about a week called The Genius of Islam, Episode 3, that's going to talk about the evil of idol worship and associating partners with God. And so I invite everyone to, to watch that for a more detailed elaboration of this. This one coming in from Azri. Schizophrenia says, Daniel, do you think it is just and righteous to prevent people from speaking against Islam to conceal testimony what other people have? Is that what Allah stands for? Uh, yeah, so Islam restricts uh, freedom of speech. And this is something that all cultures and societies restrict, freedom of, of speech. And you can read the book by Stanley Fish. He's a philosopher that says there's no such thing as free speech. And it's a good thing, too. And the idea is that to maintain social cohesion and social order, you have to have certain speech norms. And you have to limit speech in order to maintain those kinds of um, bonds and social cohesion. Otherwise, you're going to have chaos and destruction. And so all societies prohibit speech and liberal societies and modern uh, liberal human rights governments in the West are the most restrictive when it comes to speech because they literally assassinate and have a history of assassinating people throughout the world that have speaking, spoken out against liberalism, against democracy. Look at the assassination of civil rights leaders in American history who were arguing for racial acceptance such as Martin Luther King, Malcolm X. They were assassinated by the deep state because of their opposition to the uh, secular world order and the racist neocolonial world order. So this theories. is something that all... Daniel, you're about liberal, wait, wait, let me answer the question. You're not getting any questions. You don't get to interrogate me along with APUS and all of these atheists. So let me, let me just uh, talk deep about... Deep state. Yeah, deep let's, state. Let's give him a chance to respond. Historical facts about the assassination of Martin Luther King, Malcolm X, and look at the colonial period where uh, you have Britain, you have France, you have uh, the Netherlands who are controlling colonies and they are stamping out with brutal authority any opposition to colonial rule. They have to do we this. Must, okay? They have to do this. Otherwise, hate. liberalism we won't be go. accepted. by. So this is the free speech, the next one. Free we, speech uh, of I, liberalism and human rights. We, this next one, Le Leptoceratops says, Daniel, if a husband forces sex upon his wife against her will, is that wrong under Sharia? Uh, so Islam comes with certain marital rights. Husbands have certain rights and duties. For example, the husband has to provide shelter. He has to provide clothing. He has to provide food. It doesn't matter if the husband doesn't want to provide those things. He has to. And the state, the, the Qadi, basically the Islamic state, can force the husband against his will to provide nafaka for his wife and for his kids his children and his family. This is something that's good. This is an important policy that reduces the man's individual liberty. And similarly, the woman's individual liberty is also restricted that if the husband has a reasonable request for sexual relations, reasonable, then she is obligated to 
comply with that. If she decides not to, he can't start beating her and he can't start abusing her in a violent way. But she, uh, the Qadi can say that, look, you're not meeting your spousal duties and therefore you will um, forfeit your mahar, for example, your the bride dowry, you'll forfeit your other um, privileges as a wife. So there's give and take in marriage. That's why Islam is beautiful because it creates this dependency between husband and wife. It's not like modern sexless marriages in the West where women say, oh, I don't, I can leave my husband to have uh, no sex for months because I don't feel like it. I'm a, I'm a strong, independent woman. And meanwhile, the husband is working his tail off trying to provide for his family, but there's no obligation on his wife to reciprocate in any kind because she's a strong, independent feminist and she has to have maximum choice and opportunity. But the, the must, poor devil, he has to work and provide for all of that with no compensation must, or anything in, in return. Husband gives Pardon shelter, my, so he has a right to be in Iraq. We have so many questions. We've got to go to the next one. I do have to remind you folks, like we read them in the order they come in. I agree. We have almost all of these are for Daniel so far. It's, we're not trying to do that on purpose. We just read them in the order they come in. Apostate prophet says, Daniel, under Sharia, should homosexuals be executed if your own child... Watch the indeed. debate that I had with you, a puss. Watch just the say debate yes. I had they said, just say yes. Daniel. Watch right. the debate. Throw off the rooftop. Watch Throw the debate. Look, he's asking... So this apostate prophet, I debated him already, and all of his questions we discussed in his debate, so he's just rehashing it. This is... Uh, ridiculous! What kind you, of moderation okay. is this? James? Because because okay, the world well, wants to see I, more of that. The well, world I mean, wants I can't to see more purposely of that. just exclude questions to favor a particular Why? debater. Why not? So this say, is your channel. Why because, not? Because because I don't want to favor a particular debater. I've, you're the first person out of 600 debates that we've hosted that's asked for this. Have you we ever had? You okay. Have you ever had? So have you ever had a previous debater come this. into the chat and try to overtake the Q and A? Have you ever had that situation in your 600 debates? He's asking questions. If he wants I mean, to ask a lot of them? questions, I don't think that's no. unfair. Like, so I don't, don't think tell that's me that it's unprecedented that I have a we'll problem jump. with this. When you have well, it is unprecedented. Well, we're it's not, unprecedented so we're gonna to jump. have a we're previous debater going. come I, and hijack the chat. It's it's not unfair I for him to want to ask a lot of questions. We read them in the order that they come in. So my answer. I mean, I don't understand when I actually try to respond to you. You try to speak over me. I'm just giving you a response. Am I like? Do you not want people to hear my response because you know it's better than yours? So let's go to the next one. They said, Daniel, if your own child openly engaged in sexual interactions with the same sex, would you want your child to be executed in your ideal Islamic system? If my own child, do I want my own children and family to be subject to the Sharia? Yes. Gotcha. This one coming in from, do appreciate your question. Yavuz, let me know if I pronounce this right. Al Iriza, thanks to your question or statement, says Islam is a universal religion of peace, love, tolerance, and justice. If you are reading this, you are invited to read the Quran and decide for yourself with an open mind. Don't just listen to haters. Next one, Silver LTC says Quran 98.6, quote, those who disbelieve in Allah and his messenger are the worst of all creatures, unquote, aka worse than rats. Any response? That's that was the previous question. That, that, Daniel is awesome for that. Daniel is like, yeah, so what? They're, they're worse. That question creatures. was already asked. You're just repeating the question that was literally just asked. This one coming in from, do it's not the verbatim one, but it is true. It's on the same topic. This one from apostate prophet says, for Daniel, if he wants to force Islam, execute apostates and enslave disbelievers, would it be okay to do the same to Muslims and Muslim converts? If not, why not? Please answer the question. Would it be? No. Why would... I want people to be the people who stand for truth and justice and righteousness to be enslaved. Why? Like just because you accept that uh, warfare is necessary and slavery is necessary doesn't mean that you yourself are fine with being defeated in war. Again, I, I can ask anyone that question. Like, do you think war is necessary? And then you say, yes, war is necessary. Okay, so you're fine with being defeated in war. You're you're fine with being blown up. You're fine with being droned. What's the logic of that? It doesn't make sense. Yes, sometimes war is necessary. I explained how sometimes slavery is necessary. Sex slavery is necessary. Do I want that to happen to me? No, I don't want to die in a war. I don't want to be enslaved, obviously. But that doesn't, that's some not some kind of hypocrisy. Like Apus, here, I'll talk about Apus. Like he is just a con man. He has to lie, like just me. like Harris, to his Hindu yeah. Hindutva audience, his Christian loser audience, <laughs> who 
they that, are not are able to actually think for themselves. They just follow this con man. Conspiracy theory. All of these, all of these points sec. have I... been addressed. All of these points have been addressed in our debate that I had with Apus. But he's such a crybaby loser that he has to hijack <laughs> this debate. All right. And he Harris was... is such a and Harris on. is such a cuck that he allows Apus to hijack his stage and his spotlight. Doesn't that make Must, you feel like a loser, Harry? Doesn't that make not, you feel right, like you're not, driving the that your big right. body that was, apus? That, your big your daddy, rhetorical that, skills are good. Daddy, nah, I, I, I gotta apus, respond. Is, I, I, your big I daddy apus is taking your always, spotlight. Are you are you second Daniel, fiddle to apus, Harris? Daniel, answer, Daniel, answer that question. Always, because you're not getting any questions always, from the audience. No one cares this, about this, any of yeah, your... Yeah, all right. Yeah, exactly. We must Because go. my position is so sensible. Are you, are you people are like, whatever he says. You have to like... Okay, well, little... you ask, if you ask Harris a good question, you gotta give him a chance to respond. Are you, come are you on, Daniel. Are you schoolboy cuck, Harris? Come on. Come I, I'm wondering. Answer. Okay, you... Look, whatever kind of okay, offense to go you're, to you're imagining, I can I can go into that. And hang on, I'm gonna respond to that. Whatever is going through your mind and your manly man brain, that's fine with me. But my strategy was always... To let you speak more, you defending slavery, sex slavery, we didn't even touch torture because you, you would defend torture as well, wife beating, you've defended that. I don't have to say anything. Let the world see for itself because right now your own fellow Muslims, they're actually like this. They're like, oh, geez, he did not say that, but you did say that. So this is why that's perfectly fine. You know why people are not asking me any questions? Because my 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 positions are very sensible. They're, they're very rational. They're like, okay. <laughs> That's fine. Your case, it's not so much. You're just defending what everyone already has been indoctrinated with. So I actually have the uh, larger task oh, of you? bringing arguments, oh. bringing evidence, like citing seven Ackham century edition, old, Ackham, right, 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 Ackham, right. fourteen hundred years old. Um, 1400 years old ideas are new ideas. We're going to the next one. We've got so many questions. I hate to do this. The super destroyer says, "Apus got uh, go respond to Farid response." Okay, and then Scrump Yang says, "Daniel, you haven't." demonstrated how your stats relate to your arguments just throwing stats at someone and thinking you're one isn't how you win no they are relevant the stats were relevant to how family is dying out within the modernized human rights world that's how it's relevant how uh, families are dying out marriages are dying out communities are dying out and that is the human rights regime that is causing this kind of destruction. What other explanation is there when you have these highly modernized, highly secular states who are abiding by these human rights in the West, in the US, in Canada, in Europe, in Australia, and their marriages are dying out. They have no fertility because fertility rate is below replacement levels. So these are bad things. Everyone acknowledges objectively that these are very bad things. So what's causing that? What's causing that are, is this extremism of individual rights, individual liberty above all else. That was the argument, and all of the stats are perfectly relevant to that. This one coming in from, thank you very much for your question. The Super Destroyer says, why is Harris Sultan running away from the debate topic? Good question. <laughs> well, I don't know That's what he's very talking good. about. No, that didn't run away at all. I, I just highlighted some of the points of Sharia, and uh, he barely touched some of them like wife beating and then he said something like romance and then wife beating husband giving uh shelter to women and then therefore he has a right to beat up women but by his own logic then if okay, state gives you shelter then the state have a right to come and beat you up or something so these are really badly thought out arguments by daniel hikikachu which he and his cucks think that it's uh, something very intelligent and people will be like yay it's <laughs> a shahada let me see say uh, la, 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 because no no one's gonna say that these are beaten down embarrassing arguments and i have to just highlight my position very very simple on human rights yes we build it on new evolving situation we recognize new problem toward the best some of the world's best mind put their minds to it and then they come up with a solution it's evolving morality things we will have new challenges later on in the century when if ai comes into existence when humans don't die what about the fertility argument then if humans do live for up to thousand years must, would you still need 2.2 no mm -hmm. you wouldn't so so i have i have i have answered all the points sir. notion slave says harris quotes verses without understanding a single one or how they fit together just sad and sharia saves basic human relationships in marriages and family life harris is selfish and irrational Jeez. <laughs> oh, he's hurt. He's hurt. It's okay. Let him out. Let, 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 let him say it. 
I mean, you started your whole asleep, debate way. with calling me a sadist, calling me all kinds of you other things. You are a sadist. Things. You are a sadist. Mm, yeah. So, you are so sadist. don't laugh at other people making you fun are. of you. No, I'm saying let. I'm calling, saying let him say it. Pot calling the kettle I'm saying black. let him say you it. You did that. In a I'm saying. Well, I'm the, not going to be fair. No, yeah, no, no, it's been, I mean, it's been, it, it's been brutal from been. both sides. Uh, to be fair. So I'm not trying to pick out on anybody. But if you want to respond to the actual question, I'll give you a chance. I I will respond. I would say no. I it would have been it would pot calling the cattle black would have been the case if I would have said, hey James, why are you reading this? This is an attack on me. No, I'm saying no. Say the whole thing. It's fine. Let these people let it out. You, on the other hand, are a sadist. You have no problem in actually looking at the corporal punishment, some of the most brutal punishment, and you just shrug your shoulders and you say, yeah, well, it's just necessary. I would want it, but, you know, so well, that's what's got to happen. So, so, so you are a sadist. I mean, any sane person, and I, and I still put my faith in humanity, and I know even most Muslims, because I've seen that. I've seen hey, my Harris, Pakistani society would, would so close. Would a sadist have this? People don't do it. Would a well, that's your kids. <laughs> that belongs to your kids. Pikachu. So, okay, you know what? So, no. Don't you want to call <laughs> me Pikachu yeah. again? No, this, I don't want This is Pikachu. Nah, 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 a lot, a lot of people I, have called would you a sadist that have uh, Pikachu right here? It's Pikachu a, endorses Pikachu. me. Pikachu, we must do you want Sharia? Point. Yes, yes, I want Sharia. Apostate prophet says you will does be thrown off the rooftop. <laughs> All right, we'll talk to Pikachu <laughs> yes, later. Does, want, they say, is does Daniel, a con, con they Yes, said, he is. Does Daniel yes. believe that executing those who openly leave Islam will make humans happier? Does he think 21st century sociology and psychology agree? Uh, yeah, so every community punishes defectors. Every community punishes defectors. And this is part of preserving community. I mentioned the example of how liberals are the most brutal in terms of punishing defectors and apostates from liberalism. They have created this colonial regime where they were assassinating anyone who resisted their British or their French or their Dutch rule. So this is something where we even notice to this day of how the United States, even with this uh, recent political election, presidential election, there are a lot of uh, cracking down on speech, a lot of cracking down, a lot of people, dissenters in prison and labeling them as terrorists and extremists. This is how speech is cracked down upon within uh, even current day America. This is something very typical and very usual within all societies. Again, read Stanley Fish. There's no such thing as free speech. And Islam is no different. The thing is that the modern secular state has this uh, massive control grid. You have literally a social credit system in Europe now, in China, that completely controls people at an individual level and that's how social cohesion and order is brutally enforced but in islam you have organic social order based on shared belief on shared values on family on community and that creates social cohesion because people people naturally don't want to harm others who are in their community but if people are uh, apostating and leaving and, and blaspheming then that threatens the social cohesion of muslim society and that's why there has to be penalties and punishments on defectors but in substance this is no different than any other community in history and even the mo so-called modern civilized west it's just that the modern civilized west has this massive control grid because they've wiped out the family relations the organic relations with community and all that has been wiped out in favor of this monstrous control grid social credit uh, credit system surveillance state that we're all suffering under you got it and thank you very much want to mention folks i think i already mentioned it earlier but want to mention it again it's been pinned in the chat for a while we cannot take any more questions we can't take any more so please don't send any more questions the super destroyer says verses you'll never hear quoted in the quran uh, they say quran 90 12 through 13 and they say and what will make you realize what quote attempting unquote the challenging path is it is to free a slave yes uh, is that i can respond to that if you'd like yes go ahead um freeing a slave is a highly meritorious action in islam it's something that is encouraged but i'm not like other apologists i am very honest i say that islam did not abolish slavery and i gave the justification for that if islam abolished slavery it would have been wiped out it, muslims would have been exterminated uh 
basically for most of Islam's history. So yes, freeing slaves is highly meritorious and there's a lot of details about that because it's encouraged in the Quran, it's encouraged in the um, biography of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Uh, just like giving charity is meritorious, feeding the orphan is meritorious, all of these kinds of charitable actions are very encouraged in Islam, but that doesn't mean that Islam is, you know, abolishing private property or Islam is abolishing um, uh, having personal wealth or slaves. Yes, uh, that is allowed, as mentioned in the Quran, but it's meritorious to free the slaves. You got it. Thank you. The apostate prophet says, does Daniel want to go back to creating an Islamic empire and spreading Islam? Does he want to bring slavery back in that case? Yeah, so I mentioned um, this argument about slavery, a world with slavery that's low tech versus the horror, the terror of the modern nuclear uh, drone, trillion dollar weapons program directed at the third world, really? at Vietnam, at Africa, at the Middle East. Uh, that is the kind of world that we live in that makes slavery obsolete. It's because of these weapons programs, these nukes, weapons of mass destruction, that makes slavery obsolete. But that is a worse thing. <laughs> that Those weapons are a bigger harm and a bigger uh, disaster on the human race, as opposed to having a lower tech society, but practices Islamic slavery. Uh, that is preferable. You got it. Thank you very much for this question coming in. Closing. Closing statements. I think we, we, we should wrap it up now. I think we're, we're almost there. Um, we actually, we, we have a lot of questions. I, I, I know that it's if you can bear with me as long as possible. And I have to I have to wrap it up now, but I think because Daniel has obviously said a lot of things too, and I need to wrap it up and um, just need to respond to it. But obviously, I just I just want to wrap it up by saying that um, well, the few, few claims that one of the biggest justification for slavery or making it some sort of a lesser evil uh, that Hakika Chu has given and he's making the point that his slavery was uh, went extinct because of something worse that came out which was the nuclear weapons and uh, biological weapons etc that's actually not true um, the the movement to abolish slavery started a long time ago in the 19th century way before uh, these uh, modern dangerous weaponry even started um, there's such as the one we saw at the start of the 20th century so it's got nothing to do with that Th these things were evolving independently together so it's got nothing to do with that um, I, I would just simply say that the reason why um, the, the debate was the way it was because we acknowledge human rights is an evolving um, it, it, the, the world that we live in uh, and when we support human rights this is an evolving situation. New problems will arise and new solutions will be required. What Daniel Hakikachu is offering here is an old set of ideas for even an older older world with older problems. Those, some of those problems don't even exist anymore. So um, that, that's the reason why it, it is the way it is. Um, and as as uh, you know, as my as my master apostate prophet says, stay away from Sharia, stay away from Islam. If you'd like to respond, Daniel, you can. I, we do have more questions. I'd love to get through these questions, most of which would be for you, Daniel. And you would you could say that you'd be able to re respond to them unopposed because I, I do want to honor the questions that people put in. And so, Harris, how many okay are you talking about? How many questions? There's uh, an awful lot. Like, I would guess, let me just kind of ballpark this one, two, three, four, five. 20 to 25. I would guess 25, between 25 and 30. Well, some of these are going to be quick because they're little comments like Arsenal just won one to zero C O Y G. I'm definitely going to, I definitely have to go. Totally okay if you have to go. And I hate to do this, but okay. we won't ask questions to you because, so it'd probably be more like 20 questions, is we won't ask questions to you because you're not able to, you know, actually respond to them. Harris. So okay. those will kind of let go. Um, but okay. Daniel, if you'd like to thank respond, sure. thank you very much, I'll Harris, for being around. with us. I can make, okay, I'll make my closing statements after the questions then. Well, that is, uh, let's see. Because <laughs> he just if made his like. closing statement with his yeah, nonsense. I, I mean, I'm, I'm open to you making your closing. Technically, it sounds like it'd be fair if you did it, whatever you prefer. Okay, I'll, I'll just close. Um, and then we can go to Q&A. You got it.
Oh, oh, he left. Okay, yeah, hold on. no worries though. I'm just adjusting the picture. It'll just be scrambled for a second. Yeah, I need to adjust the pictures. But do want to remind you folks, we really do appreciate both of our guests. They are linked in the description. So if you want to hear more from Daniel or from Harris, we highly encourage you to check out their links down in the description box as I am adjusting the pictures right now. And want to remind you, we really do appreciate our guests. And so want to, as I mentioned, encourage you, you can check out their links if you would like to. Also, they are in the podcast. So if you'd like to see our guests in the actual, you could say if you want to see their links, if you're listening via podcast, you can see them there as well. And we really do appreciate these guys. They really, the debaters are the lifeblood of the channel. And so we really, that's one way you can go and check out their stuff and support them. And also other housekeeping type stuff tonight, flat earth debate, as you can see on the bottom right of your screen, it's going to be a juicy two on two. You do not want to miss it. In fact, there may be someone in particular tonight in that debate, I'm not joking that you may be surprised to see someone, a surprise guest, you might say. In other news, I want to mention next week, we will be hosting a debate between Skylar Fiction and Dr. Josh going against two Christians on biblical ethics, another juicy topic similar to today. And so if you haven't yet, hit that subscribe button as we are looking forward to those and you don't want to miss those folks. They're going to be really fun debates other news want to say Leia thanks so much for being with us today watching with Sideshow Nav we want to say thank you to all of our moderators and thank you Leia for tuning in today we're excited to have you here so big shout out and want to say thanks so much to our moderators who do a great job of trying to make sure there's no hate speech in the live chat as we do want to respect the terms of service of YouTube as we are thankful that YouTube has helped us grow immensely and so we want to you could say follow their rules. And we are thankful for YouTube recommending our videos so much, which the numbers are huge. They do that a lot and we appreciate that. So moderators, great job, thank you. And whenever you're ready, Daniel, I can jump into these next questions. Oh, should I do my closing statement? Oh, it's, it's up to you. If you wanna do the questions first or if you wanna do the closing first, I'm open to whatever way you wanna do it. Well, um, since Harris just left, let me do the closing and then we can do questions. So um, I offered a very simple argument for the Sharia. I explained that you have uh, these values within the Sharia that promote um, family, that marriage, community, and even the human race itself, and that individual liberty and equality, while they're important, beautiful values in Islam, they're not the only values. You have to have a balance with all of these values in order to promote important things like marriage, in order to promote important things like community and family. So uh, that was the summation of the argument. I brought all of these statistics that were relevant to how human rights liberalism is destroying these important human institutions. Specifically, I posed three questions to Harris. Not surprisingly, he didn't have any answers. First, I asked the Botswana question, what do human rights offer? If they're supposed to offer prosperity, why do liberal secular democracies like Botswana or Haiti or El Salvador have 10 times or 50 times lower GDP per capita than the small minority countries uh, in North, the small minority of countries in North America and Western Europe? So Harris didn't respond to that question. The balance question, should individual liberty and equality be balanced with other values in order to preserve important human institutions like marriage, family, and so forth? If so, how, what restrictions should be in place and on what basis to increase fertility rate, household size, lastingness of marriage? Again, Harris didn't have any proposal or answer to that question. And the colonial question, how is Harris's calling for human rights different from what colonial powers did to justify brutal occupation and genocide over the past 200 years? Assuming that many countries historically refused to accept Western human rights liberalism, does Harris think it was justified for those countries to be forced to accept them via colonialism? Does he think such force should be used today to coerce other countries to accept human rights? Harris didn't really... Um, respond to that question at all. So these questions are not specific to Harris. I encourage all of the listeners, uh, Muslim, Christian, whoever, pose these three questions, Botswana question, balance question, colonial question, pose this to con men like Harris, pose them to people who are pushing this critique of Islam, 
point out these questions and demand answers. Why can't they answer these simple questions? They can just engage in these kinds of distractions. I responded to everything that Harris brought up, okay, in terms of uh, so slavery, sex slavery, wife beating, capital punishment. I responded to everything. He didn't respond to a single one of my points. And that's fine because I knew that he wouldn't be able to, but others should pose these questions to him and other ex-Muslims. Uh, so yeah, that's, and overall, like I mentioned before, I invite everyone to uh, study Islam, look further into Islam, get past these uh, lies and propaganda from propagandists and, you know, investigate with an open mind. And I hope that more, Muslim, more people will see that Islam offers a very uh, attractive, beautiful vision for human life and for humanity overall. And once you get past uh, these uh, points of propaganda against Islam that have been propagated by colonial powers, by neocons, once you see through their lies and distortions and half-truths, then you can see exactly what Islam has to offer all of humanity. You got it. And so that's the closing statement from Daniel as well. As, as mentioned already, Harris had done his just before he had to leave. And I want to say thank you, Daniel, for staying with us longer than expected to answer these questions. We really do appreciate you going the extra mile as Harris stayed for even Harris stayed for longer than he promised. And so we did not expect so many questions. We have an awful lot. And so we do appreciate you being a good sport. This one coming in from Lindsay Marie says, Daniel, if you're such a proponent of Sharia, why don't you leave the US then? Why continually condemn the West, but yet you stay? I already addressed that. I already addressed that. Um, where should I go where my immediate life is not in danger and the life of my family? Because you have again, this human rights regime, the U.S. empire, that is literally uh, bombing and invading countries, occupying them, imposing sanctions, uh, assassinating people, anyone who is opposing their global dominance. So this is something that we can see even in Afghanistan. Uh, there was a drone bombing as the U.S. is leaving, like even as the U.S. is leaving their 20-year brutal occupation, they drone strike um uh this family or these children actually and an aid worker and they admitted that it was an innocent aid worker and children at first the u.s claimed that was isis k that they had droned but then after investigation they found out that no it was actually uh children innocent children that the u.s had droned and is there any accountability for that no there's no accountability there's no uh punishment for this brutal kind of imposition that the world thinks that it owns the whole world and it can bomb everyone into submission. And they have uh, stated that they want to continue to pressure Afghanistan to abide by human rights. Otherwise, we're going to uh, pressure, agitate, we're going to impose sanctions. So that's still the plan. The U.S. hasn't given any kind of uh, guarantee that they'll leave the Muslim world alone, leave Afghanistan Afghanistan alone. If the U.S. actually were to promise, like, look, we're not going to do anything with Afghanistan or the Muslim world, we're not going to pressure, we're not going to agitate, then yeah, I would love <laughs> to move to Afghanistan or any of these Muslim countries if it means that the U.S. and these Western powers will leave the Muslim countries alone, but they won't. They haven't given any guarantee. They have no plans to leave it alone. They just want to dominate the entire globe. And so that's the reality. And all of you liberals and human rights defenders that are asking these asinine questions, ask yourself, why are people in El Salvador and Mexico and in parts of North Africa and Sub-Saharan Africa risking their lives to migrate to uh, the Western world, like North America, like uh, Europe? They're literally risking their lives to leave countries that abide by human rights. So isn't that an indictment? of human rights and, and liberalism? Why can't you make that argument? Um, why can't you be consistent? And Harris, as I mentioned, he doesn't advocate for his followers in Pakistan, living in Muslim countries, to move to Botswana, LGBT rights Botswana. Move on. Well, Thank why? you very much. Let What's the time limit? Because I have to go eventually too. So maybe if you can pick top two or three other questions and then... Let's see here. I'm going to skim through these. Um, Notion Slave thinks your question says, quote unquote, beating refers to using something as light 
as a quote unquote miswack, aka a toothbrush. It must not leave a mark or cause harm. Note the prophet never beat his wives. It is also the last resort. Quran 4 verse 34. I don't really think there's a challenge to you. I think they actually agree with you now that I read it. But next one coming in from apostate prophet says, Daniel still doesn't explain why he won't move to, let's see. You know, I did we, explain that actually. A plus. That. Yeah, we've got that one that you just covered that. And then we're earlier in the debate too. This one coming in from, let's see here. Hey, this Lindsay is the, Marie. The art- Sorry, go ahead. Lindsay Marie says, a Taliban recently killed an Afghan folk singer just for being a musician and banned all live music is this islam sahih bukhari 5590 is this peace i don't know what that news is about i haven't read it so you got it and then let's see that was for harris this one coming in from lewis romero thanks for your question says daniel about the maximizing pleasure conflicts with well-being quote is glorification of suffering the logic reaction the logical reaction to reconcile a non-ideal reality with an idealized deity who wants suffering? I don't think that Islam wants suffering. Islam is trying to give guidance for humanity so that human beings uh, can live their best life and flourish and enjoy and have a beautiful life. That's what Islam offers, and that's very explicit in the most hardcore orthodox understanding of islam and it's it's very clear in the quran and and the islamic sources of revelation we are are meant to live a happy life to live a joyous life to enjoy our family to enjoy our children to enjoy our spouses Um, this is something that islam wants for humanity uh, not suffering Uh, maybe that's like a christian understanding but islam doesn't have that it's just uh, the creator knows best what is best for us and what is going to lead to that happiness and some of those things are beyond our understanding if we don't think about it but when we actually look into some of these provisions within islamic law Um, Some of them are going to limit individual freedom. That's true. Some of them are going to limit equality. That's true. Uh, But overall, the overall benefit is going to be for the benefit of human beings and happiness. The thing about man-made rules and regulations, such as are, are found in liberal human rights, is that it's coming from a finite mind. So when the liberal theorists in the 1960s with their sexual revolution said that people should ha- be open to have sex with whoever they want, whenever they want, they couldn't anticipate that the harms that would come 50 years, 60 years, 100 years down the line. All of the stats showing that marriages are dissolving, people are involuntarily celibate because men and women they can't find someone to even have sex with Um, they couldn't have anticipated these kinds of problems because they're human beings they have finite intellects this is exactly why we need divine guidance from the creator of human beings you got it this one coming in from do appreciate your question lepto ceratops says may i ask this which current countries that exist today come closest to implementing true sharia Mm, I, I really don't know. I, I have to do. I haven't done an analysis of all the countries and all of their policies to be able to judge that. So I can't make a definitive statement. Gotcha. And then this one coming in from Tell San Oberlander says this whole debate was. Let's see. I'm not. That's confusing. I'm not sure what that means. But yeah, maybe one more question. You got it. One more, and I'm going to try to find somebody who has we haven't heard a question from yet given that we're doing that. Let's see. Contrarian420 says, Harris, how would you compare the impact of your government on reducing your human rights versus religion? Are you allowed outdoors without a fine? Wait, that's for Harris, right? Oh gosh, I'm sorry. I'm like so. <laughs> it's it's been a long three hours. <laughs> it has, and thank you again for staying with us. That helps. It really does mean a lot that you do that. And Louis Romero says, Daniel, about the. Oh god, I think we read that. Mandrew Bolson says, Daniel, why in a world on the verge of overpopulation would you want higher fertility? P.S. Studies show the nuclear family is unneeded as well. 
Yeah, so I'm not sure if there's really a problem with overpopulation. Um, I, to be honest, I haven't looked into exact uh, metrics for determining what is or is not overpopulation. What I see in the world today is that the West and these high GDP countries in the West are dominating the world's resources where they are less than 10% of the population in the United States, in Canada and Western Europe, less than 10% of the population, but have control over 60% of the world's wealth. So if you have a situation of massive inequality, um, then that will lead to a lot of resource problems, a lot of overpopulation problems. But um, these are artificial problems that have been created by this modern colonial nation state uh, system that's really a disaster. It's a nightmare for humanity. You got it. And I want to say our guests are linked in the description, folks. So Daniel, as well as Harris, are linked below. We really do appreciate them coming on Modern Day Debate. And Harris, thanks for being, a, or I'm sorry, Daniel, again, still waking up. Daniel, appreciate you being a good sport today, especially with uh, uh, your, uh, your, let's see, what's the word I'm looking for? Assertive style, which we like, really, we do. And the reason is I would rather have somebody assertive like you than somebody who doesn't care. Like that is, it's just some people want to hear people speaking on what they're passionate about. So we really do appreciate you, Daniel, seriously. And we do appreciate you out there, Harris, if you get to hear this. Want to say, folks, thanks so much for being with us, whether you be atheist, Muslim, Christian, you name it. We are glad you were here. You hopefully, we want you to feel welcome and want you to know, of course, our guests are linked in the description. So with that, I'll be back in just a moment with some updates about upcoming debates as we were excited about one tonight, in fact, as well as one next week on weekend on biblical ethics with Dr. Josh and Skylar. That should be a lot of fun. So any last goodbye? Thank you, Daniel, for being with us. Uh, yeah, I just want to say thank you, James. I'm sorry uh, for cutting you off. I, I really apologize for that. But, you know, it's a uh, exciting topic and people get passionate. But I apologize. You did a great job moderating. I appreciate all the time that you spent. Thank you. That's really kind of you. And no worries at all. Seriously, <laughs> it's water under the bridge and I, I enjoy it. I like someone who's passionate. And so we really do appreciate you. It's been a true pleasure, Daniel. And so uh, we'd love to have you on anytime. The door's always open. And so thank you. Yes. And with that. We will, uh, I'll be back in just a moment, folks, with those updates on future debates. So stick around for that post-credit scene in just a moment. Take care, everybody. Thanks again, Daniel. Thank you.